The literature passage of the March 2019 SAT. This patch passage is adapted from Rita Dove through the Ivory Gate, 1992 by Rita Dove. The novel's main character, Virginia, has just found her old cello while unpacking after a move. She had not played seriously since college. Accompanying the theater troupe's performances and clowning around as her friend Parker picked out old Beatles songs on the piano didn't count. That wasn't real music. Music that made you forget where you were, made you forget where your arms and legs ended and luscious sound began. So here in the first paragraph, we already see that Virginia sort of has lost her interest in cello. She's sort of been fooling around with her friends playing with music for fun, but she hasn't been playing seriously. She wasn't playing the type of music that, you know, made you forget where you were and made you forget sort of all the stuff that you were feeling. She had started playing the cello when she was nine shortly after the move to Arizona. At the beginning of the school year in Akron, every child in fourth grade had been issued a pre-instrument called the tonette so the teacher could determine who had an aptitude for music. Virginia had liked the neatness of the tonette, its modest musical range, and how it fit into her school desk on the right side. Whenever she covered a finger hole, she felt the contour of its slightly raised lip and imagined she was playing the tentacle of an octopus. She had chafed through months of scales and simple songs, waiting for the moment when she would walk across the auditorium stage and choose, kneel among the rows of somber black cases, undo the metal clasps and fling them open, uh, fling open the lid to reveal her instrument, a flute or a clarinet, glowing softly, half buried deep in blue velvet. So here, even when she's sort of on this um, tonette, this pre-instrument, um, she's already dreaming of the day when she'll sort of graduate from this and she'll get to choose her instrument that she's going to play for the rest of her life, not the rest of her life, but like for the rest of her years. So she dreams of, you know, one day walking onto the stage and picking out her flute or her clarinet. These are the instruments that she sort of um, dreams to play. But before she could make her choice, they moved to Arizona. There, the music instruments were stored in a small classroom trailer. And when she opened the flute case, she nearly winced from the glare bouncing off that polished silver, those gloating caps and hinges. The clarinet was worse. It looked like an over-designed walking stick. It sounded like a clown laughing and had reeds that need to be softened with spit. The music teacher shut the cases with a succession of curt clicks. That leaves the strings, she sighed, leading the way back through the noonday blaze and into the main building where the violins, violas, cellos, and double basses were housed. There, by virtue of its sonorous name, Virginia asked for the violin cello and was too intimidated by the teacher's growing impatience to protest when what emerged from the back closets was something resembling not a guitar but a child-sized android. So here in these two paragraphs we see that after her move to Arizona, she realizes that she doesn't really like the flute. She doesn't really like the clarinet. They're, one, not very physically appealing. They don't look very nice. And two, she thinks that the clarinet sounds just really bad. So she's in sort of this back room one day where the instruments are stored. And um, sort of her teacher that's showing her these instruments is growing very impatient because... Um, she has to show her all of these instruments um, for her to choose. And she ended up choosing the violin cello not because she liked it, not because she sort of wanted to play it, but because she was too intimidated by the teacher's impatience to ask for another instrument. In her anguish, Virginia bowed her head and blindly accepted the instrument. It was not long before, however, before she realized that she had made a good choice, for the sound of its name was synonymous with the throbbing complaint that poured out of its cumbersome body. It took her nearly a year just to learn how to hold it properly. She had been accustomed to practicing after school, but one weekend evening while her parents were out, she dragged the instrument into her bedroom and used pillows to prop the music on the armchair. She was just about to sit on the edge of the bed when something, maybe the shadow thrown from the flowered lampshade or the slats of lighting shifting from the street, made her want to do things right. She got a straight back chair from the dining room and sat down correctly, bringing the instrument slowly toward her body. The lamp picked up the striations down the back of the wood, each strip slightly different, a little browner, a little more golden, but meeting its mate at the spine, a barely perceptible seam. For the first time, she saw that the back of the cello was rounded like a belly, the belly of a tiger she had to bring close to her, taming um, it before she was torn from limb to limb. She had to love and not be scared, and show the cat that it did not need to growl to protect itself. 
The animal stood on its hind legs and presented its torso to hers. One paw curled like a ribbon behind her left ear. It was heavy. She sat very straight in the chair in order to support it. Funny how fantasy works. And in memory, I haven't thought about that evening in years. So she's sort of looking back here. It's sort of like a flashback. Virginia bent down and laid the cello case on its back as she knelt to unsnap the metal clasps. So sort of in these last few paragraphs, Virginia is really looking back and talking about how one day she came to this realization that she should be you know, playing the cello right and doing things right instead of sort of just fooling around as she had usually been. And it's in this practice session where she sort of sets everything up upright that she realizes you know she realizes that this cello is like a tiger and a tiger that she has to love and not be scared of and to show this sort of tiger that it need not to protect itself so now let's move on to the questions number one the repetition of the phrase made you forget in lines five through six primarily serves to so let's take a look um that wasn't real music, music that made you forget where you were, made you forget where your arms and legs ended and luscious sound began. So let's consider the context here. She's talking about how she hasn't played music seriously since college, how she's sort of been fooling around with her music, you know, playing with her friends on the piano, whatever, whatever. And she's talking about how that isn't real music. Real music is music that forgets where you were, makes you forget where your arms and legs ended and luscious sound began. So taking a look back at the questions, I would look for an answer choice that talks about sort of the powers of music, the way music makes you feel when it's played correctly, the way that real music, you know, invokes emotions or um, motivates you. So really the correct answer choice for number one is going to be A, emphasize the qualities Virginia associates with powerful music. Once again, this idea of powerful and real music, music that made you forget where you were, made you forget where your arms and legs ended, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are the qualities that Virginia associates with powerful music. Number two, in the passage, the description of Virginia's experience with the tonette illustrates which aspect of her relationship with music. Okay, so let's take a look here. Um, here, when she's talking about the tonette, she talked about how she liked its neatness, its modest musical range, blah, blah, blah. But she also talks about her dedication to practicing. She had chafed through months of scales and simple songs, waiting for the moment when she would walk across the auditorium stage and choose, kneel among the rows of black cases. So she's sort of very interested in this music. She's sort of very dedicated and very committed to playing music because she does practice it and she does look forward to the day that she'll get to choose her permanent instrument. So um, the correct answer for number two is going to be B. A trick answer for number two is possibly A, but um, C, we can kind of assume that, you know, if she's playing scales and all this complicated music at a young age, she must have an extraordinary aptitude, right? But if we sort of take a step back and consider it um, deeply, we can see that it doesn't really um, demonstrate an extraordinary aptitude. It just shows her interest and dedication. Nowhere in the passage does it say she had a talent for music or an extraordinary aptitude, so we can't really choose that as our answer. Number three, as used in line 38, housed is most similar in meaning to which other word as used in the passage. Okay, so line 38. Um, let's see. Um, that leaves the string, she sighed, leading the way back through the noonday blaze and into the main building, where the violins, violas, cellos, and double basses were housed. Housed. This isn't like, you know, they're living there because these are obviously inanimate instruments. This is talking about where the violins, violas, cellos are stored, where they're sort of um, put there to, um, you know, wait until someone claims them and uses them as an instrument. So the correct answer for number three is going to be C, stored. Number four, based on the passage, which choice best describes Virginia's reaction to the flute and clarinet in the classroom trailer? So let's take a look back at these lines here. But before she could make her choice, they moved to Arizona. There the music instruments were stored in a classroom trailer. And when she opened the flute case, she nearly winced from the glare bouncing off that polished silver, those gloating caps and hinges. So she doesn't like how the flute looks. The clarinet was worse. She doesn't like how the clarinet looks either. It looked like an over-designed walking stick, sounded like a clown laughing, and had reads that needed to be softened and spit. So overall, she doesn't like how the flute looks, she doesn't like how the clarinet looks, she doesn't like how the clarinet sounds, 
and she doesn't like how you sort of have to spit on the reeds to be able to play the clarinet. So the answer to number four is going to be B. She was repelled by the appearance of both instruments and also by the sound of the clarinet. Number five, according to the passage, Virginia allows herself to be assigned the violin cello because, okay, so let's take a look here. Here is the sort of this uh, paragraph starting in line 34 is the place where she gets the violin cello from her teacher. And I recall the main reason why um, she sort of did not protest another or ask for another instrument was because she was too intimidated by the teacher's growing impatience to protest. So here we see concrete evidence that she was too scared to ask for another instrument. And that's why she ended up choosing the violin cello. So number five is going to be A, because it shows that she was too reluctant, she was too shy, she was hesitant to request an alternative, seeing as the teacher was already kind of annoyed at her. Number six, in the passage, the narrator suggests that Virginia perceives a relationship between which aspects of a musical instrument. Okay, so let's sort of take a look. Um, here, um, in this passage, uh, when she talks about the sound of the cello and sort of her um, feelings towards choosing it, she says, It was not long, however, before she realized that she made a good choice, for the sound of its name was synonymous with the throbbing complaint that poured out of its cumbersome body. So she's saying that the sound of his name was synonymous, sort of, um, there is sort of a connection between the sound of its name and sort of the type of sound that the instrument makes. So um, for that reason, number six is going to be A, because there is this sort of relationship, there is a sort of correlation between what an instrument is called and how it sounds, as taught by these lines, around lines 46 through 48, because the sound of its name, according to Virginia, is synonymous with the throbbing complaint of the cello. So number seven is just the best evidence question for number six. So the answer to number seven is going to be D, again, the lines that we just talked about earlier. Number eight, in the sixth paragraph, lines 49 through 71, the narrator suggests that Virginia recognizes a need to change her attitude toward the cello from one of. Okay, so um, she wants to change her, um, sorry about that, she need, wants to change her attitude toward one, from one of to one of. Um, so what was it at the beginning? What was her attitude toward learning cello at the beginning? And what was the attitude of her learning the cello toward the end? And this really happens toward the end of the passage when she talks about the cello as a tiger. She said she had to love and not be scared. She sort of has to love this sort of instrument and not be scared of approaching it, not be scared of, you know, practicing it um, and show the cat that it did not need to growl to protect itself. So she sort of needs to become more affectionate towards her instrument if she wants to sort of um, do it right, do things right, and play things the right way. So for this reason, number eight, the answer is going to be C, apprehension to calm affection. And where can we see this directly in the text? Um, we see apprehension in the fact that she's sort of scared, she's sort of reserved, she's sort of um, nervous, she's not really sure how to act around this sort of foreign tiger, her cello. And this sort of calm affection is shown in the lines when she had, when she says that she has to love her instrument and to not be scared of it. She has to show love, she has to show an affection to her instrument. So number eight is going to be C. Number nine is just the best evidence question for number eight, and the answer to number nine is going to be D. Again, line 66 through 68, the lines that we just talked about. Um, she had to love and not be scared and show the cat that it did not need to growl to protect itself. Last question for this passage is number 10. In the context of the passage as a whole, the italicized sentences in lines 72 to 73 mainly serve to, um, so let's see, lines 72 through 73. Funny how fantasy works and memory. I haven't thought about that evening in years. So this is sort of a flashback, her current self, Virginia's current self, looking back at that evening where she decided to commit to the cello. So this is sort of a flashback and a look back in time. So it sort of shows a different perspective. Um, the story is from the past while the narration is from the present. So it shows a sort of dilation in time and a shift in perspective. So um, the answer to number 10 is going to be D, indicate a shift in time and perspective. And that wraps up 
our analysis of the literature passage. Moving on to the second passage now, a science passage. This passage is adapted from Elizabeth Svoboda, What Makes a Hero? The Surprising Science of Selflessness, 2013 by Elizabeth Svoboda. A variety of studies have confirmed the strength of the connection between altruism, altruism meaning you know, sacrificing for others by doing good, and well-being. In 1999, the behavioral medicine specialist Karison sorry, not Karison, Carolyn Schwartz, then at the University of Massachusetts, and her colleagues divided multiple sclerosis patients into two groups and had members of one group call members of the other regularly to provide them with emotional support. After tracking the groups for three years, Schwartz found that the helpers, the people in the phone call group, reported profound improvements in their self-worth and their mood. Okay, so here the idea that sort of Practicing altruism, maybe volunteering and giving your time for others, helps um, improve your own self-worth and your own mood. These people seem to be blossoming, Schwartz says. They talked about how helping other people transform their experience of multiple sclerosis from something that victimized them to something that enabled them to be a positive force in the world. In a 2010 survey of more than 4,500 American volunteers, 89%, nearly 9 in 10, stated that volunteering improved their sense of well-being, while a sizable majority reported that it lowered their stress levels and enhanced their sense of purpose in life. This connection appears to hold true regardless of culture. In a 2012 study of older Maori and non-Maori in New um, Zealand, those who volunteered were often scored higher on happiness measures. In best case scenarios, regular helping may even help stave off early death. Analyzing data from more than 7,000 respondents collected for the government's longitudinal study of aging, the researchers Alex Harris and Carl Thorensen found that frequent volunteers had a 19% lower mortality rate, um, risk rather, than people who had never volunteered with uh, when the subject's level of social support was taken into account. That means volunteering is associated with longer survival independent of the advantages that social tiers provide. So basically, no matter what social tier you're at, no matter if you're rich, you're poor, you're middle class, whatever, no matter that, no matter your social class, um, volunteering has been shown to increase your time of survival, increase your lifespan. Even more dramatically, when the University of Michigan researchers studied 423 older couples who were followed for five years, those who helped others were nearly 60% less likely to die during the study period than those who never helped. While many survey studies have found more or less strong associations between helping and happiness, the University of California Riverside psychologist Sandra Liu Bermersky wanted to test the connection in a real-world setting. She asked students to carry out five random acts of kindness of their choice every week for six weeks. If they could choose anything that benefited others from making a homeless person a meal to helping a kid with school assignment, the subjects experienced higher levels of happiness than controls when they performed all five kind acts in one day, suggesting that the well-being boost is pronounced when people help often. So um, this study shows that sort of helping in clumps, helping in sort of short spurts, short often but frequent spurts, helps to increase well-being. Interestingly though, students who spaced the kind acts out, performing them on different days, didn't experience the same happiness boost. Um, Liu Bermiski's work suggests altruistic acts may need to be frequent in order to confer a long-lasting change in well-being. Okay, so this is one of her key findings. With isolated acts of helping, says the London School of Economics social scientist Francisca Borgonovo Borgonovi, it could be that there's a very short, narrowly defined time and space bump in happiness that doesn't shift your overall happiness in any meaningful way. So basically, the fundamental premise, sort of the um, final result of um, Sandra Liu Bormiski's study was that helping or volunteering your time or um, being altruistic improves your well-being and gives a boost to your well-being if um, you do these acts uh, when they're in close succession. If you do them all in one day, it helps boost your well-being more than if you were to do one every single day. And um, Francesca Borgonovi basically just provides a explanation for why this is so.
On balance though, being generous boosts your mood and health because it strengthens your sense that you're doing something significant. The social psychologist Sarah Conrath of the University of Michigan notes that helping others may signal our bodies to release pleasurable chemicals such as oxytocin. Okay, The boost we get from helping may also mute our stress response, causing us to release fewer jarring stress hormones such as cortisol and norepinephrine. So this is sort of a chemical explanation for what's going on. We get more oxytocin released in our bodies and less cortisol and norepinephrine, which means less stress. And figure one and figure two, um, let's see. So figure one seems to be um, just data from um, showing how a lot of people agreed that sort of these statements were caused by volunteering. And then um, figure two shows that people have a stronger positive trend in well-being when all five acts were performed in a single day. Okay, number 11. Based on the passage, which choice best describes the relationship between emotional support and well-being as shown by Schwartz's study? So Schwartz's study is in the beginning of the passage in sort of this first paragraph. And here we say that, we see rather that um, Short's findings were that nearly 9 in 10 stated that volunteering improved their sense of well-being and it lowered their stress levels and enhanced their sense of purpose in life. Um, additionally, adding that those who volunteered often scored higher on happiness measures and it may stave off early death. So we see this correlation between volunteering, uh, you know, being altruistic and having a positive effect on self-worth, on mood, on well-being. So the correct answer for number 11 is going to be uh, C. Givers of emotional support reported increased well-being. Number 12. As used in line 16, positive most nearly means. They talked about how helping other people transform their experience of multiple sclerosis from something that victimized them to something that enabled them to be a positive force in the world. Um, positive sort of here means something that's helping something else, um, something that's beneficial to the world, something that does good in the world. So the correct answer choice for number 12 is going to be D, beneficial. Number 13, as used in line 42, associations most nearly means. While many survey studies have found more or less strong associations between helping and happiness, the University of California Riverside psychologists, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so associations between helping and happiness. This gives off the concept. Uh, gives off the meaning rather that um, there's a sort of a correlation, there's sort of a relationship, there's sort of a connection or a link between helping and happiness. So we should be looking for those words. And if we take a look at the answer choices, we see that the answer choice is going to be um, a links. Because the word links, you know, shows the connection between helping and happiness as shown by the study in the passage. Number 14, if true, which finding of a survey of the uh, of the general population would most likely undermine the author's interpretation of Liu Bormisky's study. So when we look at something that would undermine the author's argument, we're basically looking for something that would say the opposite of the result of Liu Bormisky's study. So first we have to understand what the result of the study was. So let's look. Um, so let's see. Here, um, around lines 57, you can see we highlighted this while we were reading. Liu Bermisky's study, uh, Liu Bermisky's work rather, suggests altruistic acts may need to be frequent in order to confer a long-lasting change in well-being. So this is their conclusion. They concluded that um, in order to note a long-lasting change in well-being, altruistic acts need to be um, done you know, close together. They need to be done often in a short period of time rather than spaced out. So what could sort of um, undermine this argument? What sort of opposes this argument, if true? And the correct answer for number 14, if we read all the answer choices, is going to be D. Occasional altruistic acts re result in long-lasting increases in personal happiness. Um, this undermines the uh, general statement given by the study because the general statement given by the study, the study shows that um, frequent acts of altruism confer a long-lasting change, whereas this undermines it because this says that not frequent but occasional altruistic acts result in long-lasting increases in personal happiness. So that's the reason why number 14 is D. Number 15, 
In line 61 through 64, the author includes the quotation from Borgonovi, most likely too. Okay, so 61 through 64. It could be that there's a very short, narrowly defined in time and space bump in happiness that doesn't shift your overall happiness in any meaningful way. Um, so this is sort of an explanation for the um, effects on your overall happiness and um, well-being as stated by the Leo Bromisky, um study. So the study showed that um, altruistic acts need to be frequent in order to confer a long-lasting change in well-being. And why is that? Because when altruistic acts are isolated, there's a very short, narrowly defined time and space uh, where a bump in happiness doesn't shift your overall happiness in any meaningful way. So it's sort of an explanation to um, the result in the study. So we see that the answer choice for number 15 is going to be B. Number 16, the author most strongly suggests that people who perform altruistic acts benefit partly because of Okay, so let's take a look at the passage here. Um, so we can see here in around lines 65 through 67, we can see, um, going back to the question again, uh, why people benefit um, from performing altruistic acts and it's because that sort of being generous being altruistic boosts your mood and health because it strengthens your sense that you're doing something significant so this is why your mood and health are boosted this is why um, people who perform altruistic acts benefit um, they benefit because um, it strengthens your sense that you're doing something significant with your life and so the answer is going to be A, beliefs that they hold about the effect of such acts. Um, the people who perform altruistic acts believe that um, these acts that they sort of, these acts of good that they do, they believe that it's something significant and that's why they benefit from doing these acts. So the answer choice number 17, which is the best evidence to 16, is going to be, again, the lines that we just talked about, around lines 65 through 67, because, again, they give concrete evidence as to why people um, benefit from these altruistic acts that they perform. So 17 is going to be C. Number 18, according to figure 1, the highest percentage of respondents agreed that volunteering has. Okay, so let's see, figure 1. Um, the highest percentage, so we see 92% um, right here, this last uh, row here, and it comes from people that agree with the statement that volunteering enriches my sense of purpose in life. So we should be looking for that answer choice. And so for that reason, the answer choice for number 18 is going to be C, as shown by the data in the table. Number 19, based on information in the passage, it can reasonably be inferred that the majority of survey respondents presented, represented, rather, in figure one. Okay, so let's see. Um, the volunteers represented in figure one are all volunteers, or mostly volunteers that feel physically healthier, feel a high sense of well-being, feel lower stress, and feel a sense of purpose in life. Um, so we're looking for information in the passage that can lead to this inference. Um, we're looking for information in the passage that can sort of support and give reason to um, this sense, this data collected in the table here. So if we look for sort of a reason as to why people would feel physically healthier, or feel less stressed, we really come to this last paragraph here. And um, they really talk about how uh, doing something significant, being generous, uh, releases pleasurable chemicals such as oxytocin. And it also mutes our stress response, causing us to release fewer jarring stress hormones such as cortisol and norepinephrine. Um, so the answer choice for number 19 is going to be B. 
um, based on the information in the passage, it can reasonably be inferred that the majority of survey respondents represented in figure one, again, the majority of the people being the people that feel physically healthier, the people that feel an increased sense of well-being, the people have lower stress, the people that have a sense of purpose in life, it can be inferred that these people may have experienced decreases in the level of certain hormones after volunteering. This is shown in the passage in these last two lines here. Um, the boost we get from helping may also mute our stress response, causing us to release fewer jarring stress hormones such as cortisol and norepinephrine. Um, so in sort of analyzing the answer to number 19, we also um, sort of as a side product get the answer to number 20, which is the best evidence question for number 19. Um, so the lines again that we just talked about, um, these last three or four lines or so, really give evidence to number 19. So number 20 is gonna be D. The last question. Number 21, which choice best states the relationship between the two figures and the passage? So let's see. Um, so this uh, data table, figure one, um, is a direct co is directly correlated to one of the research topics that is discussed in the article because once again in a survey of more than 4,500 American volunteers 89% stated that volunteering improved their sense of well-being well if we look at the table again it repeats this information 89% um, improved sense of well-being again this is the 2010 survey 4,500 American adults um, if we look at figure two um, we see again that it's adapted from this person's study, Sandra Liu Bormiski's study. So we can see that again, the figure correlates with the study that's being talked about in the passage. So we can reasonably sort of infer, we can deduce from this that the relationship between the two figures in the passage is that the figures are derived from the studies that are talked about in the passage. Um, they're connected because the figure shown is the figure that has data from the study if that makes sense at all so number 21 the answer is going to be b both figures provide the specific results of studies discussed in the passage because again we see this correlation in numbers this 89 percent this 89 percent here this 2010 survey of 4500 american volunteers again here so we can see that um, the data that the passage is talking about is the exact same data that shows up in the figures so yeah, for that reason, number 21 is gonna be B. And that wraps up this passage. Moving on to the next passage, a science passage. This passage is adapted from Jonathan Shaw, the bionic leaf. Harvard scientists have created a bionic leaf that converts solar energy into a liquid fuel. The work, a proof of concept in an exciting new field that might be term termed biomanufacturing is the fruit of a collaboration between the laboratories of a professor of biochemistry and systems biology, Pamela Silver, and professor of energy, Daniel Nocera. The pair, who began collaborating two years ago, share an interest in developing energy sources that might someday have practical application in remote locales in the developing world. Silver dubbed the system bionic because it joins a bio a biological system to a clever piece of inorganic chemistry previously developed by Nocera. That invention, widely known as the artificial leaf, converts solar energy into hydrogen fuel. So they're saying that this new bionic leaf was actually built upon a previous scientific invention developed by Nocera, which was known as the artificial leaf. And basically, the key difference between the bionic and the artificial leaf is that the bionic leaf actually has some biological or some living components to it, while the artificial leaf was 100% artificial. Nocera's artificial leaf, which serves as the fuel source in the bionic leaf, works by sandwiching a photovoltaic cell between two thin metal oxide catalysts. When submerged in a glass of water at room temperature and normal atmospheric pressure, the artificial leaf mimics photosynthesis. Current from the silicon solar wafer is fed to the catalysts, which split water molecules. Um, oxygen bubbles off the catalyst on one side of the wafer, while hydrogen rises from the catalyst's wafer on the other side. So this sort of first half of the second paragraph is basically talking about how the artificial leaf works. 
um, the water molecule enters and it's split into oxygen and hydrogen. Nasser has been perfecting the artificial leaf since he first demonstrated it in 2011. Today it is far more efficient than a field grown plant which captures only 1% of the sunlight's energy. He says that he can reach efficiencies of 70-80% to 80% of the underlying solar wafer technology which is improving constantly. The hydrogen it produces is a versatile fuel from a chemical standpoint. Nasera reports and could easily become the basis of a fuel cell, but it has not been widely adopted in part because it is a gas. So there's this is a major problem because, um, you know, it's a gas. Liquid fuels are much easier to handle and store, hence the new bionic leaf's importance. In the bio bionic leaf, the hydrogen gas is fed to a metab metabolically engineered version of a bacterium called Ralstonia eutropha. The bacteria combine the hydrogen cells, hydrogen with carbon dioxide as they divide to make more cells. And then through a trick of bioengineering pioneered by Anthony Sinsky, professor of microbiology and of health sciences and technology at MIT, produce isopropanol, uh, rubbing alcohol, which can be burned in an engine much like gasoline additive ethanol. So, um, with this sort of discovery and advancement of Anthony Sinsky of I, uh, MIT, the bacteria is able to sort of combine the um, hydrogen and the carbon dioxide that is split from the water of the uh, artificial leaf to produce isopropanol, which is obviously liquid, which is in a much preferable and much more usable form. The advantage of interfacing the inorganic catalyst with biology is you have to have an unprecedented platform um, for chemical synthesis that you don't have with inorganic catalysts alone, says Brendan Colin, a graduate student in systems biology in the Silver Lab. Life has evolved for billions of years to produce catalysts capable of making chemical modifications on complicated molecules with surgical precision, many times at room temperature, Colon explains. If you can use enzymes for building chemicals, you open the door to making many of the natural compounds we rely on every day, such as antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer, and pharmaceuticals. Members of Silver's lab have been working to perfect the tricky interface between the catalyst and the bacteria so that they will thrive and grow optimally. In its first iteration, the bionic leaf matched the efficiency of photosynthesis in plants, uh, far below the capabilities of Nocera's underlying artificial leaf. Now the team is working to surpass blue-green algae, which at 5% efficiency do better at photosynthesis than plants. Cologne has been developing a strain of the bacterium that grows well even at the lower voltages that might be emitted by the solar wafer at the system's core on a cloudy day. For example, this could dramatically improve overall efficiency. Ultimately, though, Silver's goal is not to create fuels from this work, but high-value commodities in remote places. Fuel, she notes... Riley is cheap because we fight wars over it and developing a system that we could make fuel at a lower price that could make fuel at a lower price than gasoline would therefore be very difficult she says drugs on the other hand are high value commodities so engineering a bacterium to produce not isopropanol but a vitamin or a drug may be her next goal for this system okay so now um, having read the passage let's take a look at the questions uh. Um, number 22. Um, the primary purpose of this passage is to um, A. Discuss the development and significance of the bionic leaf. This makes a lot of sense because do we discuss the development? Yes, we do discuss how it originated. We discuss how it came from sort of this artificial leaf and it eventually developed into the bionic leaf. And we're also talking about its significance, you know, how it's going to be used in the future, how it's going to give energy and give a reliable source of fuel to maybe third world, maybe rural countries. Um, commercial uses doesn't make sense. Present a scientific debate. There's no debate going on. And um, the differences between these two leaves aren't really highlighted. So 22, the answer is going to be A. Number 23, the first paragraph implies that Silver and Nocera's research was motivated in part by a desire to address which problem? 
Okay, so if I recall, they want to sort of provide a reliable source of fuel for third world and other remote countries. So let's try to find that here in the first paragraph once again. Um, so here, like I highlighted, the pair who began collaborating two years ago share an interest in developing energy sources that might someday have a practical application in remote locales in the developing world. So which answer choice does this sort of, um, you know, give evidence to? Um, if we look here, the best answer choice is going to actually um, be D. Some communities lack adequate access to reliable energy sources. And if we take a look, one of the easiest trap answers to have fallen for here is going to be answer choice a many developing countries lack natural resources that are convertible to fuel because again it talks about developing countries and it also talks about um, fuel but we also have to consider every other part of this answer do we know from the passage for sure that many developing countries lack natural resources that are convertible to fuel this answer choice is more so focused on the conversion of fuels rather than the access to energy sources and the access to these um, sources of fuel. So for that reason, A is wrong and 23 is going to be D. 24 is the best evidence for number 23. And like we said, we pointed to, <coughs> excuse me, we pointed to sort of these lines, lines 7 through 10 as evidence to number 23. So the answer choice number 24 is going to be C. Number 25, the main purpose of the second paragraph, line 16 through 31, is to, okay, so without looking at the answer choices, um, we see that the second paragraph is about Nocera's artificial leaf. And as we know from the passage, um, the artificial leaf is sort of the fundamental basis. It's sort of what the bionic leaf was built upon. So I would say the main purpose of the second paragraph is to sort of detail the uses, detail how the artificial leaf works and how efficient it is as a device to be built upon by the bionic leaf. So looking at our answer choices, um, our choice for 25 is going to be B. Explain the workings of a central component of the bionic leaf. First thing to check off, is the artificial leaf a central component of the bionic leaf? Yes, it is. Because once again, um, we look back at the passage, it joins a biological system to a clever piece of inorganic chemistry developed by Nocera. So again, this bionic leaf is built upon the artificial leaf. So the artificial leaf is the central component of the bionic leaf. And last, uh, last off, does it explain the workings of this central component of the bionic leaf? Yes, it does, because it does talk about how water is split into oxygen and hydrogen, and it does talk about its effectiveness in capturing sunlight. Number 26. The passage indicates that the artificial leaf carries out which chemical process? Okay, so once again, in the same second paragraph, we see that current from the silicon solar wafer is fed into the catalyst, which split water molecules, um, oxygen bubbles off the catalyst on one side of the wafer, while hydrogen rises from the catalyst on the wafer's other side. So if any of you have taken chemistry before, you know that water is H2O, so its component elements are hydrogen and oxygen. And we see that here. We see that um, water molecules are being split into their component elements. Oxygen bubbles are split from the hydrogen. So that is the um, sort of chemical process that we're looking at in the artificial leaf. Um, so 26 is going to be A. Number 27, as used in lines 28, captures most nearly means. Let's take a look. Um, so it's used in the context. Um, it is far more efficient than a field-grown plant, which captures only 1% of the sunlight's energy. Um, so captures here most nearly means something that absorbs energy, something that uses energy, something that fixates the sun's energy and is able to sort of convert that energy and use it. So um, looking back at the answer choices, the best and Sorry, the best answer choice for number 27 is going to be C, uses, because the plant is using the energy from the sun. We have our last four questions here. Number 28, as used in line 42, trick most nearly means. Uh, so line 42, this bacteria, the bacteria combine the hydrogen with carbon dioxide as they divide to make more cells. And then, through a trick of bioengineering pioneered by Anthony Sinsky, 
um, they produce isopropanol. So trick isn't sort of like this magic trick here, but it's more of sort of like a scientific, maybe a scientific advancement, a scientific method, a certain method, a certain maybe clever tactic that um, maybe they discovered and they were able to use to allow this, um, allow this bacterium to create isopropanol. So let's take a look. Clever technique, this aligns a lot, like very well with what we talked about because once again, um, this technique of um, bioengineering in producing isopropanol is a clever technique and it is a you know technique that's relevant to sort of the um, bacterium and it's also relevant to sort of how the um, bionic leaf works. If we look at the other ones, it's not really uh, very appropriate. Like a mischievous prank? Uh, no, that doesn't really make sense. An illusion, a deception? Yeah, these words are just wrong in context. So number 28 is going to be a clever technique. Number 29, Cologne's remarks in the fifth paragraph, lines 48 through 60, mainly serve to, okay? So Cologne says, the advantage of interfacing the inorganic catalyst with biology is that you have an unprecedented platform for chemical synthesis that you don't have with or inorganic catalysts alone. So he is saying that by you know, interfacing inorganic catalysts with biology, we unlock a lot of possibilities with you know, sort of the chemical um, experiments, the chemical processes that we can sort of explore because with or inorganic catalysts alone, we're sort of limited to this narrow um, field. Whereas with the integration of biology, we have sort of access to a lot more things to look into and to research. So taking into account that, when we look at the answers, we see that the answer choice is going to be actually D. Emphasize the innovative nature and great potential of the bionic leaf. Um, again, once again, looking at the quote, we see that it's innovative because, you know, um, it provides a sense of uh, opportunity and uh, an unprecedented platform. Once again, this also ties into sort of the potential of the bionic leaf because you unlock a lot of potential and you open a lot of future doors for future research. Number 30, as presented in the passage, the researchers make which assumption? about the bionic leaf that has yet to be substantiated. Um, if something that's something that's not been substantiated, sorry about that, something that's not been sort of proven, something that's not been you know backed up yet, at least by the research or by um, the article. So um, if we take a look at the answer choices, let's see, the efficiency of the leaf can equal the efficiency of plant photosynthesis. Um, well, they do talk about that here, but um, they don't make the claim that um, the efficiency of the leaf can like sort of uh, match the efficiency of the plant leaf because um, it's already proven. Um, so we see here that the first iteration, the bionic leaf, matched the efficiency of photosynthesis in plants. So it's already proven. So that for that reason, it can't be um, un unsubstantiated or not proven yet because it's already given in the passage and it's evidenced. B, the leaf can be used to produce chemical compounds other than isopropanol. Um, is that true? Um, so if we take a look here at around um, lines 56 through 60, we see that this actually is a real possibility. Um, we see that if you can use enzymes for building chemicals, you open the door to making many of the natural compounds we rely on every day, such as antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and pharmaceuticals. Um, so he, Cologne here is saying that, you know, sort of if you're using, going to be using these organic, these biological um, enzymes to build this stuff up, um, there is a real possibility of um, being able to produce chemical compounds other than isopropanol that is given um, here. Um, so for that reason, um, f uh, as shown by these lines right here that we've sort of mm, just pointed to, these lines right here, we see that 
it is a assumption made because he does talk about how there is a potential for making new natural compounds such as antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, but it has yet to be substantiated. It has yet to be proven and sort of scientifically validated by their studies. This is just sort of looking into the future and thinking about the possible outcomes and the possible um, sort of possible just the possibilities of this bionic leaf and um, organic enzymes in general. So the answer choice in number 30 is going to be B. If we take a look at the uh, other answer choices, see the artificial catalyst using the leaf can be replaced by natural catalysts. Um, we don't, uh, we see this, um, but we don't really like, uh, it isn't really an uh, like a point that's yet to be substantiated um, in the article because they do talk about sort of these artificial and natural catalysts but it's not an assumption they don't make an assumption based on this fact so C is going to be wrong um, the leaf can generate a fuel that powers engines as efficiently as ethanol does let's take a look um, so here they say that um, the thing produces isopropanol, which can be burned in an engine much like the gasoline additive ethanol. It says it can be burned in a similar way, but it doesn't necessarily say that um, the engine power it powers the engine as efficiently. So we can't make that assumption. We can't sort of jump to that um, assumption, and that assumption can't even really be made because we're kind of just, you know picking out straws here. We can't really deduce that from here. That's not a val uh, viable assumption that can be made. So for that reason, number 30 is going to be uh, B. And number 31 on the best evidence question for number 30. Um, once again, which best evidence question shows that you know, the answer choice you chose is unsubstantiated, it's not proven yet. And once again, we see that the lines we talked about, if you can use enzymes for rebuilding chemicals, you open the door to making many of these natural compounds we rely on every day, such as antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and pharmaceuticals. Um, sort of, it shows that this assumption has yet to be substantiated because it uses words like if. Um, and open doors. Um, it hasn't really been scientifically done yet. It hasn't been scientifically proven yet. There is no substance to this assumption, but we can, you know, sort of look forward to it in the future. So number 31 is going to be D. And that wraps up this passage. Moving on to the history passage. Passage 1 is adapted from Albert Lethuli's speech to the South African Congress of Democrats, delivered in 1958. Passage 2 is adapted from Harold Macmillan's address to the South African Parliament, delivered in 1960. At the time of these speeches, South Africa was in the process of transitioning from a British colony to an independent republic under a system of white minority rule known as apartheid. Muthuli was the president of the African National Congress, a group advocating equality for black South Africans. Uh, Macmillan, the Prime Minister of Britain, was addressing the all-white South African Parliament. Passage 1. Those of us who are in the freedom struggle in this country um, have really only one gospel. We may possibly shade it in different ways, but it is a gospel of democracy and freedom. If we are true to South Africa, that must be our vision, a vision of South Africa as a fully de uh, democratic country. It, can, it cannot in honesty be claimed that she is yet really democratic, when only about a third of her people enjoy democratic rights, and the rest, notwithstanding the fact that they constitute the majority, are still subject, uh, subjected to apartheid rule. I emphasize the words are still because I do believe firmly that it is not a state that can be perpetuated. Apartheid rule is the antithesis of democracy. Um, apartheid, in theory and in practice, is an effort to make Africans march back to tribalism. So in the beginning, um, Lithuli really makes his point clear. And his point is that South Africa, they have a vision of being fully democratic, but the structure, the government structure that's in place right now, this apartheid structure where a white minority rules um, 
South Africa is really the antithesis of democracy. It goes against everything that democracy believes in. He believes that um, the black South Africans should be given the same rights as the whites and other people in South Africa. And that, he believes, is the first step to achieving um, a true democracy in South Africa. Sometimes very nice and pretty phrases are used to justify this diversion from the democratic road. The one that comes to my mind is the suggestion that we Africans will develop along our own lines. I do not know of any people who really have developed along their own lines. My fellow white South Africans enjoying what is called Western civilization should be the first to agree that this civilization is indebted to previous civilizations from the East, from Greece, Rome, and so on. For its heritage, Western civilization is really indebted to very many sources, both ancient and modern. The essence of de development along your own lines is that you must have the right to develop and the right to determine how you develop. Okay, so they're saying that um, here, uh, Lithuli is saying, um, you know, a lot of the white rulers in South Africa are saying that, oh, they're they're sort of defending um, apartheid rule, and they're saying that um, this diversion from the democratic road is justified because um, Africans will be able to develop along their own lines. Um, they use this sort of euphemism, this sort of thing, to make an excuse for apartheid rule. But Lithuli refutes this, and he says that... Um, the essence of development along our own lines. In order to develop along our own lines, um, we have to like, give um, black South Africans and other South Africans um, the right to develop and the right to uh, determine how they develop. So we have to give these individuals the rights to their own development in order to achieve a um, true democracy. It is essence its essence is freedom and beyond freedom self-determination okay so again this idea of the individual being able to determine what he wants to do and how he wants to develop this is the vision we hold for our future and our development one might ask is this vision of a democratic society in south africa a realizable vision is it attainable is it you know um logical is can it actually be done or is it merely a mirage I say it is a realizable vision, for it is in the nature of man to yearn and struggle for freedom. The germ of freedom is in every individual, in anyone who is a human being. In fact, the history of mankind is the history of man struggling and striving for freedom. Um, indeed, the very apex of human achievements is freedom and not slavery. Every human being struggles to reach that apex. So in the last paragraph, uh, Lithuli talks about why this vision is attainable why he can see this you know democracy happening in south africa and the reason he states is because in all humans there is this germ there is this you know innate drive towards freedom in every single man and the history of humanity has always been a question of you know attaining freedom and struggling for freedom and that's the reason why he thinks that um this sort of revolution in south africa is possible so now let's see what passage two has to say the wind of change is blowing through this continent, and whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact, and we must all accept it as a fact, and our national policies must take account of it. So this wind of change is probably this movement that, um, this movement of democracy for, for South Africa. It's probably the movement to kind of overthrow apartheid rule and the movement to give black South Africans the same rights that white South Africans have. And um, he states that, Macmillan states that whether they like it or not, you know, whether they agree with this wind of change or they disagree with it, it's going to, you know, have, it's going to take its effects and it's going to affect the history of South Africa no matter if, you know, anyone likes it or not. Of course, you understand this place better than anyone. You are sprung from Europe, the home of nationalism, and here in Africa you have yourselves created a free nation, a new nation. Indeed, in the history of our times, yours will be recorded as the first of the American nationalists. And this tide of national consciousness, which is now rising in Africa, is a fact for which you and we <clears throat> and the other nations of the Western world are ultimately responsible. So um, he is saying that, keep in mind that um, this author of the second passage, the speaker of the second passage, is addressing the all-white South African parliament. So he is saying, when he says, um, we are responsible, he's saying that we are responsible for um, addressing this tide of national consciousness, which is now rising in America. And um, this is like a sort of um, major 
difference between the two passages because passage one talks about you know self-determination um, the drive in all human beings to uh, develop as an individual whereas passage two talks about more of um, the people in power you know sparking change and driving change instead of the individual for its causes are to be found in the achievements of western civilization i am sure you will agree that in our own areas of responsibility we must each do what we think right <clears throat> what we british think right derives from a long experience both of failure and success in the management of these affairs we try to learn and apply the lessons of both our judgment of right and wrong and of justice is rooted in the same soil as yours, in Christianity and in the rule of law as the basis of a free society. Okay, so here he talks about how um, sort of there are similarities um, in the values that South Africans and British, the British hold. This experience of our own explains why it has been our aim in the countries for which we have borne responsibility, not only to raise the material standards of life, but to create a society that respects the right of individuals. So again, similar to the first passage, we see this uh, mention to the respects of rights to individuals, the allowing of individuals to develop. A society in which men are given the opportunity to grow to their full stature, okay? Again, this idea of individual growth and individual um, sort of development. And that must, in our own view, include the opportunity of an increasing share in political power and responsibility. Um, so he's saying that um, the government, the parliament really should be obligated to give their citizens, give these black South Africans, give these other people an increasing share in political power. A society finally in which individual merit and individual merit alone is a criterion for a man's advancement, whether political or economic. Finally, in countries inhabited by several different races, it has been our aim to find means by which the community can become more of a community and fellowship fostered between its various parts. So bridging the gap between black South Africans and white South Africans and creating sort of this unified and homogenous community is um, the ultimate goal of Macmillan. Okay, so now that we've looked at the passage, let's move on to the questions. Number 32. In passage 1, Luthuli argues that South Africa will become a fully de democratic country only when black South Africans. What? Okay, so let's see. He talks about here in this beginning part of the passage that they have a vision for South Africa to be fully democratic. Um, but he goes on to say in the next sentence that there are there is a certain limitation. There's a key limitation that prevents South Africa from achieving this democracy. And that's the fact that a third of their countries doesn't enjoy democratic rights. So this third of the country obviously means um, the black South Africans that are still subjected to the apartheid rule, the rule that's um, of white people. So um, in reality, he's really saying that, um, as shown in answer choice, A, black people black south africans really don't enjoy the same rights as white um, south africans they don't enjoy this one third um is the white people only one third of the people enjoy democratic rights and the majority the black south africans don't enjoy the same rights as white citizens number 33 lothulia refers to very nice and pretty phrases line 17 primarily to show that language is being used in order to Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so in line 17, she says, sometimes very nice and pretty phrases are used to justify this con diversion from the democratic road. So basically, um, she's saying that um, these white rulers in South Africa are really putting their actions in a nice way. They're trying to sort of make an excuse um, for their actions by making it nicer than they seem they are. So for example, let's say um, they're saying that, you know, this the white rulers of South Africa are saying that they're letting Africans develop along their own lines. And this is really just a very nice and pretty phrase to sort of um, describe the um, control that they're asserting over the black South Africans, but also sort of the... Um, democracy that's being taken away from them. It's sort of a euphemism in the way. Um, they're using nice and pretty phrases to sort of cover up and obscure their the reality that's going on. 
they're saying that they're letting them develop along their own lines but if we take a look deeper under the surface we see that that's not really the case so number 33 the answer is going to be b to obscure indefensible governing system um, this this governing system that the whites have currently in South Africa is inexcusable and they're using these very nice and pretty phrases to sort of obscure and to sort of um, give an excuse and to sort of provide a euphemism for the harm that they're actually doing to the black South Africans so they're basically just making it seem as if uh, the things were better than they really are Number 34, when the Lithuli describes the vision of a democratic society in South Africa as realizable, lines 36 through 37, he means that this vision can be. Okay, so 36 through 37. Is this vision of a democratic society in South Africa a realizable vision? Is this vision um, achievable? Is it attainable? Can it be um, realistically, can it be done? So that's the answer choices that we should be looking for. Um, so if we take a look at the answer choices, we see that the answer choice is going to be C. Achievable, achieved, realizable, really just means the same in context. Number 35. In passage 2, Macmillan implies that the growth of national consciousness in Africa is... Okay, so let's take a look. Um, he talks about this national consciousness in the first paragraph. He says that the wind of change is blowing through this continent, and whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. So he is sort of saying that um, this national consciousness, this growth, cannot be stopped. It's inevitable, sort of, because it's like a wind. It's blowing through this continent, and whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's still going to grow. So it's inevitable in that sense. So the correct answer choice is going to be answer choice C. Inevitable, because nationalism in Africa is a force that cannot be stopped. Um, going along with the wording of the wind of change and the wind that blows through this continent, whether the people like it or not. In that way, it's inevitable. Number 36. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? And if we take a look back, um, these lines that we talked about, that they talked about the wind of change and national consciousness is answer choice A, lines 45 through 49. Number 37. In passage 2, Macmillan presents his argument to the South African government by... Okay, so how does he present his argument to the South African government that they really need to give um, these individuals an increasing share in political power? Well, they, he sort of says here that um, um, their judgment, their judgment of right and wrong is rooted in the same soil as yours, in Christianity and in the rule of law as the basis of a free society. So he is basically saying that um, South Africa, our judgment, South Africa, uh, British judgment, and uh, South African judgment is rooted in the same soil as yours in Christianity and in the rule of law of basis as a free society. So he provides that reasoning to um, sort of give evidence as to why democracy, full democracy, should be allowed in South Africa because it aligns with the values that Britain has. So the answer choice for number 37 is going to be A, by asserting that Britain and South Africa share certain important values. Because once again, we see the similarity between the values because um, he says that our judgment is rooted in the same soil as yours. And he, you know, provides evidence of this as uh, in Christianity and also in the rule of law as the basis of a free society. So Britain and Africa share certain important values. Those important values are the values of Christianity and the value that the rule of law um, as a basis of a free society. And um, if we take a look at the next question, number 38 is just the best evidence question for number 37. And these lines really just serve as the best evidence. So we should look for that, those lines in our answer choice. So that's around lines uh, 65 through 69. And if we take a look here, 38 um, D is going to be the correct answer. <clears throat> Number 39. Lithuli would most likely respond to Macmillan's demand for a society in which all individuals have a share in political power and responsibility um, by arguing that Okay, so so what would Lithuli resp what does Lithuli think about the share in political power and responsibility? Well, um, uh, 
<clears throat> a society in which all individuals have a share in political power and responsibility sounds like a society that is um, completely democratic and completely aligns with the democratic ideals. What does Lithuli think about this? Well, if we you know, pay attention to what we read in the passage, Lithuli really thinks that this existence of apartheid rule in Africa prevents South Africa from being completely democratic. It prevents South Africa from having all individuals share in political power and responsibility. So Lothuli would most likely say that um, the this equal share of political power and responsibility among all individuals is hindered and it's prevented by the apartheid rule that's um, talked about in the passage. So um, answer choice B is really going to be the correct one for 39 because once again, such a society, a society that has all individuals with an equal share in politics and responsibility is impossible as long as apartheid exists in South Africa because again, this apartheid takes away the democratic rights of the black South African city. Citizens. Number 40. Lithuli and Macmillan would most likely agree on which statement about freedom. A. Just societies give people the freedom to develop as individuals. Is this true? Can we find examples of this in both passages? Once again, it's both passages because Lithuli and Macmillan, the authors of both passages, would most likely agree. So, do they agree that um, just societies give the people freedom to develop as individuals? Let's see. Well, here um, in line 21, <clears throat> Lithuli says that um, sort of these Britons are British, sorry, not Britons, but British people are saying that they're letting Africans develop along their own lines. And he also says that the essence of development along your own lines is that you must have the right to develop and the right to determine how to develop. He also talks about self-determination here. So we can see here that Lithuli really believes that just societies really allow people to develop as individuals. But does Macmillan say that? <clears throat> Let's take a look. So Macmillan says here that um, that uh, the rights of individuals also need to be respected in a society. He says that in line 72 here. You can see that we highlighted. Um, he also says that men need to be given the opportunity to grow to their full stature and um, they need to be given individual responsibility. So we really see that um, throughout both of the passages there is a really strong emphasis on the development of individuals in just societies. So A is going to be correct for number 40. <clears throat> 41. The speeches of Lithuli and Macmillan differ in their approach to social change in that. Okay, so differ, the key word here. How are they different? So let's um, consider. Um, Lithuli suggests that major social social change in Africa, South Africa is unlikely to happen soon, while Macmillan argues that significant change is imminent. Does Lithuli really say that you know South African change is unlikely to happen soon? He says that um, the germ of freedom is in every individual. Every man is inclined to seek this freedom. He never says that you know this major social social change is unlikely to happen soon he only says that it's prevented by apartheid rule so we can rule out a b Lithuli implies that the people of south africa themselves will initiate social change while Macmillan emphasizes the role played by those in positions of power this seems like a very logical answer because Lithuli does imply that people themselves will initiate social change. He says that the germ of freedom is in every individual, the history of man struggling and striving for freedom. He talks about individuals, you know, sort of rising up and initiating social change. He uh, implies that the people of South Africa themselves will initiate social change. Um, while Macmillan does, he does emphasize the role played by those of positions in power. Um, if we take a look later in these lines, he says that, um, and that, must, in our view, include the opportunity of an increasing share in political power and responsibility. So he is saying that <clears throat> um, these, uh, the parliament, the 
you know, the South African white parliament has a responsibility to raise material standards, but also create a society that respects the rights of individuals. This is the responsibility of the South African parliament. This is the responsibility of people who have positions of power. So this is a key difference between the two. So for that reason, number 41 is going to be B. And that wraps up this passage. The last passage on this test, it's going to be a science passage. This passage is adapted from Robert N. Hazen, The Story of Earth, the first 4.5 billion years from stardust to living planet. The moon is bone dry by conventional wisdom, okay, actually drier than bone, which retains a significant water component even when baked in the desert sun. Multiple lines of evidence point to this aridity. Earth-based telescopes reveal no characteristic infrared absorption. Moon rocks from all six Apollo landing sites held no detectable traces of water, at least by 1970 analytical standards. And the finding of unrusted iron metal after 4 billion years on the lunar surface would seem to preclude even a trace of corrosive water. So we know already from the first paragraph that the main idea of this article is going to be about whether or not maybe some research regarding um, whether or not water exists on the moon or not. It's a funny thing about conventional wisdom though. Eventually someone will challenge what everyone else knows to be true. And once in a while, something really interesting will be found. So already this author points to a significant discovery. In 1994, a single flyby of the Clementine spacecraft mission produced radar measurements that were consistent with water and ice. Okay, so already we see that uh, maybe these initial theories are being disproven. Though many planetary scientists were unconvinced. Okay, so why were they unconvinced by this evidence? Four years later, the lunar prospector employed neutron spectro spectroscopy to detect a significant concentration of hydrogen atoms and hence possibly water ice or water containing minerals near the poles. Still, many experts pointed to implanted hydrogen ions from the sun's solar wind as a more likely source of the signal. So here we see that um, there was a, a concentration of hydrogen atoms on sort of the um, poles of the moon, but um, sort of scientists kind of dispelled this, they brushed this aside. They said, oh no, this these hydrogen atoms weren't from water, they were probably from the sun's solar wind. So they still didn't believe that there was water or traces of water on the moon. Then in October 2009, NASA smashed the upper stage of an Atlas rocket into one of the moon's craters, the Cabeus Crater, near the southern lunar pole, and scrutinized a plume of impact debris for signs of H2O. Sure enough, the flurry of dust incorporated a small but significant amount of the life-giving stuff, enough to renew interest um, in lunar water and its possible origins. Three back-to-back -back articles in Science that same October established that evidence for water on the moon is now unambiguous, okay? So it's sort of been solved. There is water on the moon. It's not ambiguous anymore. Enter Eric Hari and his colleagues at the Carnegie Institution. Using an ion micro microprobe, a highly sensitive instrument that hadn't been available to the first generation of scientists who studied the Apollo samples, Hari's team has revisited the colorful glass beads collected during lunar missions in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Other scientists had examined the glass beads for signs of water decades earlier, but their detection cap capacities were no match for the ion microbe microprobe's ability to resolve measurements at the scale of a millionth of an inch. Um, so basically, they're saying here that um, this new technology allowed them, this new ion microprobe allowed them to sort of search for water and prove the evidence of water in a way that hasn't been possible before. Hari and his co-workers polished a variety of glass beads so their round cross sections were revealed in the iron probe. The beads' outer rims proved to be very dry with only a few parts per million water, but the cores of the largest beads have as much as 46 parts per million. Okay, so there is evidence in these iron beads. Over billions of years, most of the glass beads' original water has evaporated to space, more from the, outsi uh, more from the outsides than from the cores. However, based on the significant amount of remaining water deep inside the beads, Hari and his colleagues calculate that the original water content of the moon's magma may have been as high as 750 parts per million. Um, a lot of water compared to many volcanic rocks on Earth, and more than enough to drive surface volcanism that would have dispersed magma in explosive eruptions billions of years ago. If that much water powered volcanoes in the moon's past, then a great deal of water must still be locked somewhere 
uh, inside the moon's frozen interior. And since the moon formed primarily by the wholesale excavation of Earth's primordial mantle during a collision with another massive object, our planet's deep interior likely holds prodigious amounts of unseen water as well. Okay, so he's saying here that since the moon basically formed from the Earth, um, from this mantle collision, um, it is likely that, like the moon, the Earth also has a lot of water in its core as well. Okay, now let's look, take a look at the questions. Number 42, according to the author, challenging the conventional wisdom. Okay, so what does he say? In the second paragraph, he says that there's a funny thing about conventional wisdom though. Eventually, someone will challenge what everyone else knows to be true. And once in a while, something really interesting will be found. So he is basically saying that um, sometimes when people you know are brave enough to challenge these conventional wisdoms something really interesting some really interesting scientific discoveries can be found so the answer to number 42 is going to be d they sometimes lead to significant new insights they sometimes lead to a very interesting um, new result or new insight number 43 According to the passage, which choice is true about the 1994 Clementine spacecraft mission? Okay, so the Clementine spacecraft mission is sort of here in line 615. In 1994, a single flyby of the Clementine spacecraft mission produced radar measurements that were consistent with water and ice. So this is sort of the first, um, the first evidence of um, water on the moon. So I would say it's sort of a initial initial maybe discovery that sparked this research into water on the moon um, a it provided evidence about the moon that was featured in science magazine um, this wasn't the thing that sparked a feature in science magazine that was sparked by later um, discoveries so a is wrong b it was not specifically designed to detect water on the moon um, well we don't know what it was specifically designed for the only thing we know that it uh, was that it produced radar measurements that were consistent with water and ice. So we can't say anything about the design, so B is wrong. It offered preliminary indications of water on the moon. This sounds right, um, because preliminary indications for basically like the first signs of water on the moon, the first discoveries of water on the moon, these are the preliminary indications. It did not use the most up-to-date radar technology. Um, so again, we don't really see that. We can't tell from the passage what radar technology it used and whether this radar technology was up-to-date at the time or not. So D is going to be wrong. Number 44. It can reasonably be inferred from the passage that the idea that the moon was completely arid was reinforced in part because... So why did sort of scientists believe... Why was this idea that the moon was completely dry reinforced? Um, so let's take a look. So here, sort of, in the passage, they talk about how they did find these traces of hydrogen atoms, but later on, the scientists had, were doubtful about this because they thought that the hydrogen ions were from the sun's solar wind. Um, so basically, this kind of answers number 44 because this sort of evidence may have actually been from a different source the evidence may have um proved actually another point or may have been because of a different cause than the one that they believe um, it had so um looking at that um Scientists were unfamiliar with some of the powerful analytical tools. This analytical tools and unfamiliar unfamiliarity with them is not really mentioned, so A is going to be wrong. Some scientists were willing to challenge the conventional wisdom of the, about the moon. Um, this is true, but this didn't really reinforce the idea that the moon was dry. Evidence that might have contradicted this notion could have been explained in another way. Yeah. This makes a lot of sense because the uh, specific evidence that might have contradicted this notion, the fact that hydrogen atoms were found on the moon, it could have been explained in another way. And this way that it could have been explained was because the sun, solar, wind sort of um, made these hydrogen atoms go to the moon. So because um, the existence of these hydrogen ions could be explained in another way, it sort of reinforced the idea that the moon was completely arid and that it didn't have any traces of water. So C is going to be the correct answer for 44. And the answer for number 45 
are going to be the lines that we just talked about, um, sort of lines 23 through 25, where the scientists say that the hydrogen ions were likely from the sun's solar wind. So 45 is D. Number 46, as used in line 44, resolve most nearly means. Okay, so let's take a look here. Um, but their detection capacities were no match for the ion microprobe's ability to resolve measurements at the scale of a millionth of an inch. So resolve, um, we're talking about an extremely small scale, a scale at the millionth of an inch. So um, when we say resolve here, um, we really are talking about uh, the ion microprobe's ability to distinguish between measurements at this small scale. The ability of the ion microprobe's uh, to sort of tell the difference between, to make precise measurements at this scale. So the correct answer for number 46 is going to be A, distinguish between. Number 47, as used in line 59, drive most nearly means. A lot of water comparable to many volcanic rocks on Earth and more than, uh, and more than enough to uh, drive surface volcanism that would have dispersed magma in explosive eruptions billions of years ago. Drive here means to cause, to incite, to sort of fuel, to um, sort of, yeah, like just those words, like um, cause, uh, fuel, drive, sort of the, um, the, uh, the original water content of the moon's magma sort of drives this uh, volcanic activity on the surface of the moon. It shows the relationship. It's a cause and effect relationship between the moon's magma, the water, and the uh, volcanic activity on the surface. So um, the correct word for number 47, I mean the correct answer choice for number 47 is going to be B, fuel. Um, the surface volcano activity was fueled by the water content of the moon's magma. Number 48, the author implies that any water currently present on the moon, okay, so what does he say about the water present on the moon? Did it have its primary source on the earth? Um, I do remember him talking about that um, the moon formed primarily by the wholesale excavation of the earth's primordial mantle during a collision with another massive object. So the because, you know, the moon formed from um, the earth, we can reasonably infer from this, we can reasonably, um, you know, read this implication as the fact that the what was, the water on the moon was primarily sourced from Earth because the moon was created from the Earth itself. So A seems like a very logical answer. How, uh, it's contained mainly in glass beads. Mainly here, it's very... It's, it's an answer that's hard to choose because we can't really tell from the passage whether or not it's contained mainly in glass beads. Is it mainly in glass beads, mainly in the moon's core, mainly somewhere else? We don't know from the passage, so we can't choose that. We'll eventually increase in volume. Um, we never know. Like, again, this hasn't been stated in the passage, so we can't choose it. Exists in liquid form as well as in ice form. Well, we know it sort of does exist in ice form, but we can't logically make an assumption about the liquid form. We see here that um, the author says a great deal of water must still be locked somewhere inside the moon's frozen interior. That does indicate that there is um, liquid in, I mean water in ice form, but we never see any indication of water in liquid form. So D is wrong. So A is going to be the correct answer for 48. Number 49, which choice provides the best evidence for the previous question? So we're looking for, again, the lines that show um, the fact that the moon sort of was born from the earth. And those lines occur in around line 65 through 68. So the correct answer is going to be D for number 49. Number 50, according to the figure, okay, at what distance from the core is the water concentration within lunar glass bead uh, number five, approximately 15 parts per million. So we're looking for a measurement on this graph where the um, water concentration is 15 parts per million. So we see here that 15 parts per million, if we go directly across, we see here that um, it's the second dot from the right. And that occurs at around 
100, 105 maybe micrometers. So um, the answer to number 50 is going to be D, 100 micrometers. Number 51, based on the data in the figure, which choice is a reasonable conclusion about the lunar glass bead green number 5? Beyond 100 micrometers from its core, water is not detectable. Well, water was detected at even 120 micrometers from its core, so A is wrong. B, at no point in time did its water concentration exceed 30 parts per million. Um, we can see that in this bead, um, it did, uh, like when it was exactly at its core, it never exceeded 30 parts per million for this bead. But can we tell from the graph that at no point in time did its water concentration exceed 30 parts per million? I don't know. I can't tell from the graph. The graph never shows us, you know, this sort of change in time. Maybe a million years ago, it did have more than 30 parts per million, but the graph doesn't show that, so we can't choose no choice B. Its water concentration at 120 micrometers is approximately, um, is approximately half that at its core. So 120 micrometers, it's around maybe 10, 13, 14, 15 around 15 maybe, and at its core, it's around, you know, 28, 29, 30. So that is, you know, by simple math, around 28 divided by two is 14, and that's the um, parts per million at 120 micrometers. So C is supported by the graph, and it relies on only solely information from the graph. So number 51 uh, is very likely to be C. D, its water concentration is 50% less than it once was. Uh, than it once was is a major red flag because similar to choice B, we never, the graph doesn't show the water concentration it once was. We don't even know anything what it once was. We only know the data in the graph at a certain point in time. So we can't, um, the graph doesn't show time, so we can't pick this answer choice. So number 51 is C. Number 52, the passage, uh, sorry, not the passage, but the figure rather best supports which claim from the passage? Line four, um, multiple lines of evidence point to this aridity. Okay, that just doesn't, that's not really a claim. Uh, line six through eight. Um, moon rocks from all six Apollo landing sites held no detectable traces of water. Okay, well this isn't even a rock, so it's not even um, related, so B is wrong. Uh, lines 25 through 29, then H2O. Then in October 2009, NASA smashed the upper stage of an Atlas rocket into one of the moon's craters and scrutinized the plume of impact degree for signs of H2O. This is informative, and again, it's not a claim from the passage. Um, so A, B, and C are wrong. So the choice is probably going to be D. Lines 48 through 51, starting the beads ending... Um, Million. The beads outer rim proved to be very dry, with only a few parts per million water, but the cores of the large beads have as much as 46 parts per million. Okay, so this is supported by the passage because it does show that the outer rims are pretty dry, but as we move closer to the core of the larger beads, um, the you know concentration of water in parts per million does increase, as shown by the graph. So the answer choice to number 52 is going to be D. And that wraps up our analysis of the reading section of this test. Moving on to the writing section right now. Um, so passage one is about basically recycling packing peanuts, which contain some harmful materials into effective batteries. So question one, packing peanuts are a standard part of shipments as their cushiony material ensures that items such as glassware are not damaged in transit. So this makes sense. If we look at the other choices, um, D guarantees and ensures that's redundant. Um, C, since it says that packing peanuts are a standard part of shipments, uh, it's not necessary to say that they're commonly used. So um, the two logical choices right now, I'd say are A and B. Um, however, B uh, says that items that are shipped um, which presents redundant information because the sentence talks about items in transit and how packing peanuts are a standard part of shipments. So A, no change is the best choice. All right, number two. Uh, which choice best sets up the information that follows in the next paragraph? So the next paragraph talks about like the scientist team that like um, they pretty much like they analyze the composition of the peanuts and use their knowledge of chemistry 
and batteries to kind of convert these peanuts into, uh, into battery parts. So the best choice here is D. They resolve to use their chemical expertise to devise a solution. Three, um, by heating the peanuts in a catalyst, the carbon is isolated from the hydrogen and oxygen. So this does make sense. However, in the SAT, you want to use active voice, which means that the subject is performing an action rather than an object is receiving an action. So the best choice to, um, I guess, maintain active voice is B. Paul and his team were able to isolate the carbon because Paul and his team is the subject and isolate is the action that they are doing. Number four, further heating resulted in extremely thin micro sheets of carbon that could be made into battery anodes. Um, we don't need any punctuation here because this is all just one independent clause. There's no linking of two different clauses, so C is the correct choice. Carbon with no punctuation. All right, five, which choice best sets up the main topic of the paragraph? So this paragraph talks about how like openings in the anodes makes like the anodes, you know, absorb ions better. And it talks about how these new like recycled batteries charge faster. So the best choice is D. The anodes produ produced by Paul and his team proved remarkably effective because the paragraph's talking about, you know, like the bad or the anodes they produce and how they work well. Six, according to Paul, Openings in the surface made the anode's absorption of ions more efficient. On the other hand, the batteries charged faster. So since the first part of the sentence talks about how the anodes um, absorb ions more efficiently, and then the second part talks about how batteries charged faster, um, logically, six should be a phrase that like, kind of expands on a further point. Because on the other hand, that presents like, uh, like a contrasting point, I guess. However, the um, absorption of ions and faster like battery charging are directly related. So C, as a result, is the best choice because it presents like a cause and effect. And yeah. Seven. In addition, the anodes retained about 13% more of them than do conventional anodes. So we need to figure out what of them means. Um, it, it could make sense if... Um, them had like a logical antecedent because it's a pronoun um however like the you know the last plural noun that is present before them is anodes so um the anodes obviously don't retain more anodes that doesn't make sense so it has to be more specific and we're going to choose c ions is the best choice because that's what it's referring to and since this pronoun is unclear you need to replace it with an actual noun all right, number eight. Um, in, in addition, anodes retained about 13% more of them than new conventional an anodes, which meant that the batteries could provide more electricity before needing to be recharged than conventional batteries can. The correct choice here is just A, no change. Um, yeah, there doesn't need to be any punctuation. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just one clause. It's pretty, like, it's a big clause, but you don't need any punctuation to separate it. Number nine. The process as for recycling packing peanuts that Paul and his team developed is not all that complicated. Um, you should just substitute all the choices in here. The process as for recycling, the process for recycling, the process in order to recycle, and the process from recycling. So the, be the one that sounds the best is B, the process for recycling because the other ones are either too wordy, um, A and C are too wordy, and D doesn't make sense. So yeah, the choice for nine is B. Um, 10, this is just tone. So it requires less time and energy than the humdrum method of making lithium ion batteries. We can kind of um, like infer that 10, the word or the correct choice for 10 is supposed to mean like, like the normal method, I guess, because it's in contrast to this like new recycling method. So the best one is the best choice that matches that definition and still maintains the correct tone is C standard. Okay, 11, which choice provides the most effective conclusion for the passage? So the passage is talking about how packing peanuts were recycled to make an effective new type of battery. So the correct choice is just D. For now, Paul and his team hope that this process will be widely adopted and will turn a ubiquitous 
waste product into a useful household item. Um, this ubiquitous waste product is packing peanuts, which are pretty much everywhere. And the useful household item is a battery. All right, um, moving on to passage two. This one talks about Harold Lloyd and pretty much his inspiration and methods for, um, you know, creating his famous movie, Safety Last. So 12, um, a crowd was gathered, mesmerized by the spectacle. Lloyd watched nervously until the climber, a daredevil named Bill Strother, made it to safety. So if we look at the um, verb tense in the sentence before, gathered and mesmerized, um, the best choice to match with that is just watched. Uh, you don't need to say had watched because that doesn't, uh, that's just not correct verb tense. And watches, it's not present tense. And D, has watched is also incorrect. So the best choice is just A for 12. Um, 13, I don't know why this doesn't have the sentence, but the correct answer is um, B, because it makes a point that is elaborated on in the next sentence. So I guess you can figure that out. I can't really explain it right now because I can't, I don't see the sentence, but yeah. All right, 14. Having already made a few films in the vein of thrill comedy, the event inspired Lloyd to create his most daring film yet. So this is a pretty tricky question because it's um, pretty much subject object, like the roles of subjects and objects. So the sentence starts, having already made a few films in the vein of thrill comedy. So um, you can kind of tell that the subject should be like a person that made these few films. But in the next sentence, or the next part of the sentence, it says the event inspired Lloyd. So based on that, we can see that the event is the subject. However, the event didn't make a few films. So Lloyd should be the subject. So the correct choice is B for 14. Lloyd was inspired because that sets up Lloyd as the subject as the beginning of the sentence implies. 15. In the final scene of the movie, Lloyd's character, a department store worker trying to impress his girlfriend. So a department store worker trying to impress his girlfriend isn't like it's unnecessary information, but it's a description of Lloyd's character. So if you remember my um, video on punctuation, if it's like unnecessary information, it should be separated by a pair of commas. So the best choice is B for 15. Um, yeah, because it has a pair of commas just separating that information from the rest of the sentence. 16. He used a full-scale replica of two floors of Los Angeles' International Savings Building and set them on the roofs of pro uh, progressively taller buildings. So this one is just like pronoun clarity. So um, we can kind of try to figure out what the antecedent is, like what this pronoun should be referring to. So it's the thing that Lloyd set on the roofs of progressively taller buildings. Um, the thing that he set, he didn't set two floors of the Los Angeles International Savings Building. He set his replica on it. But since the replica is sing uh, singular, them doesn't make sense because that refers to like a plural antecedent. So the correct choice is D, it, because that's a singular pronoun that refers to the replica. 17. Um, so uh, what it is here, this is kind of just word choice, but we can see that um, the second part of the sentence is kind of like, you know, explaining the first part of the sentence. He set them on the roofs of progressively taller buildings, and then later it explains how it's a two-story building, seven-story building, then a 13-story building. So the correct choice here should kind of have a meaning that, like, like explains, I guess, explains further. And the best choice is just A, no change, because that is, it, it's a pretty good phrase to, like, you know, explain a transition between related ideas. So, yeah, that's pretty much the best way I can put it. 18 is just word choice. So the hoax allowed Lloyd to climb only a few stories at a time, while always perpetuating the illusion that he was climbing several stories higher. So hoax is kind of a pretty negative connotation. It's kind of like, like a scam or something like, I don't know, a trick with malicious intent. But the best choice here is B trick because it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a neutral connotation, but it just best matches the meaning. If you try all the other ones, um, 
trick is the best one. 19. Which choice best introduces the topic of the paragraph? So if we look at the paragraph, it uh, talks about how uh, Lloyd insisted on using a real city background, um, showing views of the street and uh, using footage that uh, another person already filmed. So it's kind of talking about if I was to choose like the best main idea of the paragraph, I'd say it was just making like his movie realistic. So the best choice is D. Lloyd is committed to making this stunt look as realistic as possible. 20. The camera angles and the climbing shots are focused very precisely, cutting out the platform and the rooftop of the lower building, but showing views of the street and other buildings in the distance. So this sentence has an independent clause, which is the first clause. The camera angles um, through precisely, that's the first one, and then cutting out to the end of the sentence, that's a dependent clause. So they should be linked with a comma, um, therefore, A, no change is the best choice. 21. Lloyd used footage that Strother filmed during his own climbs, adding to the illusion that the character was really clenching the side of a skyscraper. Clenching means to, like, kind of grip something generally with a hand. So I don't think that's the correct choice here. So we're just going to look at the connotation of each one. And the best one that kind of, like, you know, conveys the meaning that he's holding onto the side of the skyscraper, like... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess the best choice is just C, clinging to. That one just matches the best connotation. Adhering to doesn't really work because that's like sticking like a piece of tape, I guess. And embracing is just a hug. That doesn't really get, the, uh, get across the meaning that he's holding on and trying not to fall. So yeah, C is the best choice for 21. 22. Um... So this talks about, uh, I, I don't really know how to explain this one, honestly. It's just B, of course, because it's kind of obvious that Lloyd doesn't fall because he wouldn't make a movie in which he would fall and get seriously injured. So B is the best choice. Yeah, I don't really have a better explanation for that. All right, moving on to passage three. This talks about a lesser known part of the Olympics called the Pentathlon of the Muses, which is pretty much like an arts competition. So 23, the writer is considering deleting the underlined sentence. Should the sentence be kept or deleted? So the sentence before talks about how the Pentathlon of the Muses was created in 1912. And that's pretty much the whole focus of the, um, of the passage. And since this sentence in 23 talks about how the decathlon was also introduced in 1912, but it's only like the track and field events, that's kind of unrelated to the main topic, so it should be deleted. And that the best choice here is C. It mentions information that lacks relevance. 24. Um, Coubertin's pentathlon, which awarded Olympic medals for achievements in architecture, literature, music, painting, and sculpture was a part of every Olympic Games from 1948. D, delete the underlined portion is the best choice. You just don't need and which in there. And it makes sense to have that deleted. Regrettably, these competitions ceased due to a technicality. Professional athletes were prohibited from competing in the Olympic Games. Um, that The best choice is A, no change, because the other three just are too awkward or redundant. So yeah, they don't have, or they either have the wrong verb tense. 26. Which choice provides the most effective conclusion to the paragraph? Um, this paragraph talks about how professional athletes, since professional athletes were banned from the Olympic Games, and since um, professional artists shouldn't be in the pentathlon of the muses, there were like, you know, not enough participants for it, I guess. So the best choice is C. Lacking eligible participants, the pentathlon of the muses was discontinued. 27. Although the ban against professionals competing in athletics has long since been rescinded, and the International Olympic Committee's attempts to restore the arts competition has been tepid at best. So you don't need and because that makes it sound like it's like a series of things. Um, however, the second part of it is kind of I guess it's like a cause and effect. Yeah, I'm not really sure. But D is the best choice. 
and it just doesn't make sense in there, but you do need a comma in there to separate those two clauses. 28. The International Olympic Committee's attempts to restore the arts competition has been tepid at best. So has been refers to like a singular subject, but we can see that the subject here is the attempts, which is plural. So it's have been. 28 is B. 29. The writer wants to suggest that the sculpture is consistent with the philosophy of Olympism. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So if you remember at the beginning, Olympism is pretty much athletic and um, artistic accomplishment, I guess. So this uh, sculpture, uh, the best like description of it is B, evocatively fuses athletic and artistic achievement because that's like the main goal of Olympism or the philosophy, I guess. All right, 30. Um, however, the lack of publicity about the competition consigned Linton's work to virtual obscurity. So B is redundant. Um, C has, it's way too wordy. And um, D led to virtual obscurity. That's, um, that's not very specific because it could like, I don't know, it doesn't explain what was led to virtual obscurity was the competition led to obscurity and the best choice is just a no change because that's the most specific 30 uh 31 the writer wants to add the following sentence to the paragraph so again this um pdf doesn't have the sentence here but the correct answer is b it should be after sentence two number 32 talented artists such as linton um we're reaching a much broader audience so this talks about like a hypothetical situation. It says if artists were to receive medals just as athletes do, um, and the best choice that like matches this hypothetical tone is D would reach because it presents like a possible future situation. 33. Much as the Olympics athletic competitions have inspired people around the world to embrace sport and exercise, envelop, encompass, and admit they're all um, the wrong tone and connotation. So embrace is the best choice. It should be A, no change for 33. Okay, 34. Um, the passage for this final passage is talking about how zookeepers, like, you know, their level of dedication to the job and like various other things that not many people would know about their job. So, okay, 34. Um, for most zookeepers, the highlight of the workday is the time they spend interacting with animals. Besides, zookeepers spend much of their time performing activities that do not involve contact with animals. So these, um, the second sentence presents information that stands in contrast to the first sentence, um, which talks about how zookeepers enjoy being with animals. However, the second sentence says they're not always with animals. So the best choice is D, however, because um, it's the best word to like link conflicting uh, information, I guess. 35. Um, this one is just matching verb tense. So cleaning cages, preparing food, and conducting educational programs. Um, you want it to match with cleaning and preparing, so conducting is the best choice. So 35 is C. 36. Which choice most effectively combines the underlying sentences? Most zookeepers identify closely with their profession and consider their work morally important. These findings about zookeepers are demonstrated in a study by business, profession, uh, business professors J. Stuart Bunderson and Jeffrey Thompson. So the findings are that zookeepers identify closely with their profession and consider their work morally important. So the best choice to combine these is just C. Um, yeah, I don't want to read that out because I pretty much already read it. If you read the other ones, those don't combine it as well as C does. 37. Which choice most effectively uses information from the table to support a main finding of Bunderson and Thompson's study? So, um, the correct answer for 37 here is just C. Since the... Um, let's see. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't really read through this well. So C is the correct choice. If you read the uh, look at the graph, that's just the best answer. 38. 
The experience of Megan Neems, a zookeeper at Capron Park Zoo in Attleboro, Massachusetts. So there should be a comment in there because a zookeeper at Capron Park Zoo in Attleboro, Massachusetts, that's like unnecessary information that should be separated by a pair of commas. So 38 is D. 39. This leads her to think constantly about how she can make the animal's lives easier. So in this one, we want to think about plural versus possessive. So animals, um, that should be plural and possessive because it's multiple animals and it's talking about the lives that they have. So that um, that's correct. Animals with an apostrophe at the end. And then lives, that's plural too because it belongs to multiple animals. So the best choice for 39 is A, no change. 40. Which choice provides accurate information from the table? So um, in this sentence, uh, Bunderson and Thompson gauge zookeeper's willingness to give up free time to perform important tasks at the zoo without additional pay. The responses, which averaged 5.82, showed a widespread willingness to sacrifice for the job. So we should be looking at the statistic that's about sacrifice. So if you see here, willingness to sacrifice is 5.52. And the correct answer is D because of that is the same value. 41. Um, another zookeeper at Capron Park Zoo exemplifies this disposition. She says she is com uh, comfortable working weekends and holidays to care for the zoo's animals. So since these are both independent clauses, there shouldn't be a comma. Um, uh, B also doesn't make sense because although a semicolon properly links the two independent clauses, there's an unnecessary comma after it says. So the best choice is D, disposition. Or disposition, colon, she says. Yeah, that's the best way to link it. 42. Which choice provides the most effective transition from the previous paragraph? So the previous paragraph talks about that this, like the sacrifices that the zookeepers make. So the correct choice is B, in addition to working long and unusual hours. 43. Which choice is most consistent with the style of the passage as a whole? A, no change is the correct answer. Because, um, yeah, they accept pay that is low relative to their educational achievement. The other choices are too informal. Even when they're super educated, despite their having a whole bunch of education, and when compared with their attainments of an educational nature, either too informal or too wordy. So yeah, A is the correct choice. And the last question, 44. Yet for many, a love of animals and a commitment to animal conservation makes these sacrifices not just tolerable, but meaningful. So the subject is plural. It's the love of animals and a commitment to animal conservation. So make is like the action noun in sense the, or the action verb. And since the um, subject is plural, it should be make instead of makes. Makes is only if it's a singular subject, but since it's plural, it's make, be. Okay, this is going to be section number three. Number one, Tony spends $8 per month on public transportation. A $10 ride costs twelve fifty. A single ride pass costs $1.50. If G represents the number of 10 ride passes, and Tony buys in a month, and T represents the number of single ride passes Tony buys in a month. Which of the following equations best represents the relationship between G and T? And he sends $8 a month. I forgot to underline that. So, we want to know the equation. This is very simple. It's just that it equals $80. So, B is the wrong answer here. And the X value, which is going to be, what's her, not the X value, the T, the, the G value, which is the number of 10 ride passes, is twelve fifty. So, twelve fifty G plus one fifty T because what T is. The one is the single pass ride, single ride pass cost. That's why these are answer there. Okay, number two, in this equation, in the equation above, T represents Brittany, Brittany's total take home pay in dollars in the first week of work, where H represents the number of hours she worked that week, and thousand dollars represents the sign on bonus. If Brittany, Brittany's total take home pay was fifteen seventy six, for how many hours was Brittany paid for the first week of work? Well, this is just 1576 equals 18H plus 1000. So subtract 1000 on both sides. That gives me 576 equals 18H. And divide both sides by 18. You get H is equal to 32. 
And if you don't know, if, if, if you want to do a quick, you want to find a quick way to do it, in my opinion, if you know it's going to be a full, it's going to be like a full, like a whole number, you can just think, okay, what number times eight, times eight, it will give you an, a number of six. So two times eight is gives you a number of six, which means the last number of one of these answers has to be two, which is why I can just do mentally that two, number two is going to be B. However, if you can't do that, you can always just divide. It'll take, it'll take a couple of minutes, seconds longer. Okay, number three, a clothing store is having a sale on shirts and pants. During the sale, the cost of each shirt is $15, and the cost of each pair of pants is $25. Goff, Joff can spend at most $120 at the store if Joff buys S shirts and P pairs of pants, which of the following must be true. Well, the cost of each shirt is $15, and each, each pair of pants is $25. And the most is 120. So if uh, most, if it's most 120, then that means we're dealing with less than or equal to. So I can eliminate B and D right right there on the spot. And it's $15 for each pair of pants for each shirt. So that's S. So if 15 S, that would be A. What is the solution to negative 3x minus 5 equals negative 2x plus 4? This is just simple algebra. Negative 3x plus 15 equals negative 2x plus 4. Add, add 3x to this side, subtract 4 to, subtract 4 to the left side. That gives me 11 equals x. x equals 11. 4 is a. Number 5, for the function f to find above, what is the value of f of negative 1? Just plug in negative 1 for x. In this case, so negative 1 cubed plus 3 times negative 1 squared minus 6 times negative 1 minus 1. That's negative 1 cubed is negative 1 plus 3 times negative 1 squared. That's, that's just 3 times 1 plus 3 minus 6 times negative 1, that's plus 6, minus 1, so that's negative 1 plus 2, plus 3, that's 2, plus 6, 8, minus 1, 7. Seize the right answer there. Number 6, triangle ABC and triangle DEF are similar triangles, where AB and D are corresponding sides. If D equals 2 times AB and the perimeter of the triangle ABC is 20, what is the perimeter of triangle DEF? If triangles are similar triangles, then that means that the sides, uh, side lengths are proportional as well as the perimeter. And we can we know the proportion because D equals 2 times AB. So that means that's the whole proportion for both the triangles. So the perimeter of ABC is 20, then that, that times 2 is the perimeter of DEF. So that means 20 times 2 is 40, is 40, which is why B is the right answer there. Okay, number seven. There were no jackrabbits in Australia before 1788 when 24 jackrabbits were introduced. By 1920, the population of jackrabbits had reached 10 billion. If the population had grown exponentially, this would correspond to a 16.2% increase on average in the population each year. Which of the following functions best, best models the population P of T of jackrabbits T years after 1788? This is simply just an exponential exponential function. And if you remember how we said that this is formatted, it's initial value, which is 24, 24 times times the percentage increase, 16.2, but since it's an increase, it's 1.6162 to the power of t. So that the, the one of is at best is c, that's why 7 is c. Now moving on to number 8, which of the following is equivalent to the sum of 3x to the 4th power plus 2x cubed and 4x to the 4th power plus 7x cubed? <clears throat> this is just adding like terms. Here I get 7x to the 4th power plus 7x cubed plus 2x cubed. Sorry, my mistake. 7x to the 4th power plus 9x cubed. So the only one I have that is B. Sorry, my mistake, not B. It's D. I don't, yeah, I missed with that. That, that. This is 8. Here it's 8. However, we don't want A, we want number 4. That's why you should always look through all of them just to make sure you could have hands it. I, I, I almost made the mistake there. But yeah, but the answer is D for that one. My mistake. Okay, number 9. The function f is defined by f of x equals x squared, and the function g is defined by g of x equals x squared plus q3, which are the function translation in the graph of f in the xy plane but results in the graph of g. So if it's plus 3, then that, that, that's basically a vertical. Like if, it's a, if it's a constant that's being ch ch added or subtracted, then that's when it's going to be a vertical translation. So it's going to be up or down. But since it's plus 3, that means it's upward. So it's translation at 3 units upward. If it, was, if it was to the right or the left, it would be 
x minus 2, that would be 2 to write 2 units, because in this case, it's a, it's a negative of the thing. So it would be 2 units to the right squared. So that, that's how it would look if it's a whole, it's the translation left, left or right. Okay, but in this case, it's 3 units up. Okay, number 10. We have this figure. In the figure above, segments AE and BD are parallel. If angle BDC measures 58 degrees and angle HCE represents 62, what is the measure of angle CAE? So that's this angle. And if you don't know, since we know that these two lines are parallel, these two angles are the same. That's just a function of all parallel lines. We know that these two, we know, we just know that these two these two corresponding angles are going to be the same. If if these two lines are parallel, so let me just give you an example. If I have two parallel lines and I have a and I have a line going through the two parallel lines, corresponding angles are the same. So this is and since the vertical angles are going to be the same, this is going to be one. This is going to be one length. This is going to be one length. So yeah. So but cause like angles that are the same are going to be the same. Say that's just a that's just a fact of geometry. So we so so in these ways you solve for this angle. And if you want to solve for that angle, we just need to do 180 minus 62 minus 58. Sorry, I don't know why I put 88 there. Minus 58. And if you do the math properly, you should get answer choice B. 60. Number 11, an oceanographer uses the equation S equals 3 over 2P to model the speed S in knots of an ocean wave, where P represents the period of the wave in seconds, which of the following represents the period of the wave in terms of the speed of the wave. So here we just want to make it in terms of, in terms of P equals, so just, just multiply both of by 2 over 3 to get 2 over 3 S equals P. That's just answer choice A. Number 12, which of the which of the following could could be an equation for the equ graph shown in the x y plane above? So we have this graph, and we know it starts at a one, two, three, four. So it's plus four. So we all you know a and d are wrong. And for now, now we want to find the slope. But in, wait, this is what you should check. See here, the the x intercept is an in intervals of two. So this is two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So it it takes twelve x values. So changing x is twelve to go down neg negative four. So negative four over 12 is just negative one over three. So that's your slope, negative one over three, x plus four, sees the right answer there. Number 13, triangle FGH is inscribed, to, inscribed in the circle above. If arc FG is congruent to arc, so this, this thing is congruent to GH. So in the measure of angle G is 30 degrees. What is the measure of angle H? So if this is measure 30, and we know that these two, basically uh, one angle, it, represent, it, it corresponds to the arc length that it represents. So angle F, angle G corresponds to this arc length, this bottom arc length. So equipped with that information, if we know that, the, that the ang these two angles, the, the, the arc length that they correspond are equal to each other, we know that these two angles are equal to each other, which means it's an isosceles triangle. So so that means if we know these two, are, let's say these are x, both these are x, so 180 minus 30 equals 2x because all the all the things have to add up to 180. So that's 150 equals x, 2x, so x equals 75. So the, the answer is 75 degrees. Number 14, which of the following is equivalent to the, the four, fourth root of x squared plus 8x plus six, 16? First, I want to factor this to x plus 4 x plus 4 squared, and the fourth root of that. And if you remember, fourth root is just the power of 1 over 4. So that's x plus 4 squared to the power of 1 over 4. And if you don't, don't know how we do deal with exponents in this case, we just multiply these two exponents. That gives me x plus 4 to the power of 1 half. And that's the same as answer choice D. OK. Number 15, in the equation above, a and b are constants, and a, and z, a, is, but, and a is greater than 0 but less than b. Which of the following could represent the graph of this equation in the xy plane? So if, if I were to like, make this into y equals mx plus b form, it would be y equals negative a over b x plus 1. 
because I'm moving the AX to this side, I'm dividing both sides by B, so that gives me plus one. So I know that the Y intercept has to be one, so I can cross off B already. And and since I know A is less than B, then now I know that this is gonna be a negative fraction, like a less than one. So A over B is less than one. So that means I know it's gonna be like a, it's not gonna be a steep slope. It's gonna be more of a flattened slope. So, but so it can't be A because here the slope is a one, but I know it's less than one. And it can't be D either because the slope is more than one, which we I said I'm saying it's less than one, which I mean less than negative one. Sorry, it's greater than negative one. If that makes like the magnitude like. Like it's in between zero and negative one. So, like, I don't know, I don't know. Like, yeah, so like, so I guess technically since it's a negative number, it's gonna be greater than negative one. However, it's less than zero. But however, the slope is gonna be less steep. I think that's the best way to put it. So in this case, C is the right answer here because it's a, it's a less steep slope and the slope is greater than negative, I guess greater than negative one, but yeah. Like, I, I guess the magnitude is less. Okay, now on to the grid in number 16. What value of x satisfies the equation given? This is just 2x equals 9, x equals 9 over 2. Again, the, the earlier the questions are the easier questions. And a resets once we get to the grid in, 16 is going to be pretty easy. Same with 17, at least comparatively to the whole, like usually comparatively to the other questions. What is the solution to the equation above? Here I'm going to factor out 11 to the top side, x minus 3 over x minus 3 equals x. Here I just cross off this, 11 equals x, so x equals 11. Okay, now we have 18. If x comma y solution to the system equations above, what is the value of 100x plus 40y? Whenever I see them ask me something like this, I don't solve for y and x, I, or x and y, whatever. I first see if there's any way I can like, like add them or subtract them, any way to make to make it equal to this. So I recognize, let's say I add these, so I first see if I can add them to get something. So I first add them and I say get, I get 5x plus 2y. And I see that that is, that, that, that if I multiply this by 20, I get 100x plus 40y. So this is gonna equal 61. So if I'm multiplying this by 20, by 20, I multiply this by 20 as well. So I just do 61 times 20. I just do 60, if I'm doing this in my head, I can do 61 times two, which is just 122. And, but since it's 20, I, I added zero to the other side. So that's how, this is my answer, 1,220. Obviously you could have just solved for X and solve for Y independently, but I, what I would usually do is if I see them asking like 100X plus 40Y, or something like, oh, like 5X plus, sometimes I just ask for 5X plus 2Y, what's that? Always try adding the two equations or try subtracting the two equations to see if you get something that you can manipulate into this to solve, to make your life easier. Okay, number 19. If t is greater than zero and 3t squared minus 5 times 3t minus 14 equals zero, what is the value of t? In this case, what you want to do is you want to let 3t equal z at first because I recognize I can just make this into z squared minus 5 times z minus 14 equals zero. That then I can factor this into seven minus z times minus seven times z minus plus two equals zero. So now I know that now if I put I plug back in three t, I know three t has to equal seven, and three t also has to equal negative two. And in this case, t is equal to negative two over three, and t is equal to seven over three. Now, one of these is probably going to be extraneous, but I already know that I can't have a negative number in the grid in section, so I know it can't be negative 2 over 3, or I, I, I'm not allowed to put that answer choice. So I know the one answer choice I can put, can put is 7 over 3, so that's why I'm going to put 7 over 3, and that's the right answer. Okay, number 20. The function h of x is equal to x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c, the function h is defined above, where a times b times c are in integer constants. If the zeros of the function are negative five, six, and seven, what is the value of c? Now, since they gave me three different zeros, I know that the format has to be x plus five times x minus six times x minus seven, because there's no other way from, like, there's not gonna be a constant, because, and since it's just plain x squared, x cubed is no a is e, the a value is going to be one because because in this case x times x times x is just going to be x cubed and there's no coefficient 
So in this case, if I want, if I want to find the value of C, I just multiply all the diff all the constants. So this is going to be five times negative six times negative seven. Let's just say it's five times six times seven. That's going to be thirty times seven, which is two hundred ten. And that's your answer. So that's it for this section. Moving on to the next section. Okay, this is going to be section number four. Number one, Michaela is planning an event in a 5,400 square foot room. If there should be at least eight square feet per person, what is the maximum number of people that could attend this event? In this case, you're just going to do 5,400 divided by eight square feet. And then if you did, if you did that properly, you should get an answer of of 675. Okay, number two. Sorry, in the figure, three lines intersect at point P, if X equals 65 and Y equals 75, what is the value of Z? Well, in this case, you know Z is gonna equal this angle because like because of the vertical angles theorem, which means that like if, if you have two lines across like this, this angle can equal this angle. So because you know that, and you know that all three of these angles have to be added to 180 because it's a straight line, and you know what X and Y is, it's usually to do 180 minus 65 minus 75, and that's basically 180 minus 140, which is 40 degrees, which is why Z is one with 40 degrees, which is why two is C. Okay. Number three, if one half x minus one six x equals one, what is the value of x? Well, one half x is just three over six x minus one over six x equals one. That's two over six x equals one. So what times two over six equals one? Well, at six, it'll be six over two, which is three. C is the right answer there. Number four, we have scatter plot. Scatter plot above shows eight data points with XY plane. A line of best fit is shown for the data. If each data point shifted three units upwards, so that, that would mean the line of best fit would be shifted three units upwards. And a new line of best fit for the shifted points is drawn. How will the value of the Y intercept of the new line compare with that of the line shown? Well, as you can see, the Y intercept will change. It will increase, which is why A is the right answer there. Okay, number five, line L, lines L and K in the XY plane above are, are the graphs of the equation in the system. How much does the system of equations have? If you don't know system of equations for two lines, basically where the point lines intersect. And two lines can only intersect at infinitely many points or one point. And as you can see, these two lines intersect at one point or they can intersect at no, no points. But in this case, it line is intersects at one point, which is why the answer is one. So B. Oh, sorry. Number six, Gerardo has six blue shirts and W white shirts in his closet. So he has three plus W total shirts. And there are one shirts in his then there are one shirts in his closet. I guess he doesn't wear pants. If Gerardo selects a shirt at random from his closet, what, what which of the following is possibility that Gerardo will select a white shirt? So he has three plus W total shirt, but you wanna know how many white shirts that's W over three plus W, which is why A is the right answer there. Number seven, f of x equals negative blah, 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 blah the thing. A vertical bridge of, of, of the vertical height in meters of the upper arch of the harbor, harbor, harbor bridge in Sydney, Australia, above the roadway of the bridge can be modeled by the function above, where x is the horizontal distance of, of along the roadway in meters from the entry of the bridge. The graph of y equals f of x is shown in the xy plane below. In the graph, the point zero comma zero represents the entry of the bridge, which is represents the exit from the bridge at the opposite end. Well, if it's at, it would just be at the at this other point, which is 500 comma zero, or 503, I guess, comma zero, which is why D is the right answer there. Okay, number eight, the graph of Y equals F of X is a line in the XY plane that passes through the point zero comma two and has a slope of five, which of the following equations can could define the function F. Well, this is basically, it, it goes to the point zero comma two and a slope of five. So it's gonna be five X plus two, which is why D is the right answer there. 
pretty simple so far. Like, and as, as I said, as I said before, it, it, it gets, I want you to know is that the early questions are the easier questions and it gets harder as you go. At least it's supposed to get relatively harder as you go along. So if you get stuck in an early question, you may have to think is the, sometimes it's it, obvious there's always exceptions, but usually you can try to think, oh, is there something I'm missing here? Or is there any way I read the question wrong? That, that can usually help you. Okay, we have a number nine. This kind of plot above shows the citrus production in millions of metric tons in China from 2006 to 2014. Which of the following could be the slope of a line of best fit for these data? So you want to, if you drew a line of best fit, it would be something like this, whatever. But like this, if, if you, as you can see here, the slope would be like around five, like actually not, oh, not five, around 2.5, because it's like, it's half of, it's like half of five. Like if, let me try drawing this line better. It's going to be like, I obviously, I'm not the best at drawing these, but as you can see, the line will be like, it'll be half of what the x y is all the which is 20, which is it intervals of five, but it's around half of that per per x per, per year. So I, it would be two around 2.25. In this case, it's 2.12, which is why a is the right answer for number nine. Number ten, the function f is defined above, which of the following is not an x y x intercept of the graph of the function the x y plane. This is an x intercept form, which means the x intercepts are just Negative four comma zero, one comma zero, and three over two comma zero. Now, as you can see here, it's not going to be one A C D because those three are the three diff are the three x x intercepts. I got these from these each each of these binomials, so that's why B has to be the right answer there, as it is the only one that's not an x intercept. Question number 12 are combined. We have a table here, the length CT in inches of a, cha of a ch channel or the channel, whatever you want to call it, catfish in a Iowa River T years after the first year of life can be approximated by linear function C. Some values of C, C of T are graphed given in the table above. The, and then we have another equation here, the length F F T in inches of flathead catfish in the same Iowa River T years after the first year of life can be approximated by the linear function F defined by the equation above. So it's after the first year. So that's something you have to, you should know that you should notice for both of these. According to the model, which of the following is closest to the expected age to the nearest whole year of a flatfish catfish that is 30, a flat head catfish that is 31 inches long. So 31 would be F of T, 31 equals 3T plus four. Also make sure you know which equation you're using. So this would just be, 27 equals 3t. So that means t equals 9. So if t equals not but 9, however, it's it's t years after the first year. So you have to add 1 to get the total year 10 years, which is why a is the right answer. You, here, they didn't try to trick you by putting 9 years as one of the answers, but sometimes they can trick you by putting 9 years old as one of the answers, and you'd have to know that it's 10 years old. Okay, but anyway, number 12, which of the following equations could define C as a function of T? So you wanna know like what, what could fit this? So the slope, if we look from one to two, it's around 2.5, so 2.5 T, it can be B over D. And, and it, it doesn't start at 8.5, because that's, that's when T is one, you wanna know when T is zero. So it's gonna be 2.5 minus 8.5, which gives you six, which is why A is the right answer for number 12. Okay, number 13 and 14 are both combined. The result of an international survey of contact lens, fins, contact lens fittings during a given time period are summarized in the table and bar graph above. The table shows the number of total fittings and the mean age and years of the patients who were fitted for contact lenses during the time period. The total fitting consisted of new contact lens, lens fittings and refittings. The bar graph shows the percent, percent of patients who received new fittings and the percent who received refittings. What is the range in years of the mean ages of the patients surveyed who had contact lens fittings in the country shown? So we want to know what the range of the mean years. So the, the mean years, we want to know what the ranges are. So that's the highest number, which is in my, which is 36.3 and the lowest is 26.6. So you subtract those two, I would put it in the calculator just to make sure you got the right answer. But if you, if you, you can do it in your head and that's 9.7, which is why 13 is number C. Is letter, th number 13 is letter C. Okay, number 14, of the following, which best approximates the number of patients surveyed who received the refittings in New Zealand? So we, so we have this graph which shows percent refittings as, as, as the black bar, right? So for New Zealand, 
that's around slightly over 60% because it, it, you, you subtract how to find that in this case that's going this way since it's going this way is that you would have to do one you have to do the hundred percent which is the top one minus whatever it ends up at so it's around 38 i'll take around 62 percentage but on like but since it's just closest you should be fine i would just do 60 percent so we have 60 percent of new zealand which is 36.3 it's 721 so 721 times 0 0.6 I'll put in the calculator and you should get something close to 432, which is close to 447. The reason why our number was slightly lower was because I did I, I just rounded it to 60% instead of like 62, or right, something close to that. Yeah. So now number 15. A park ranger at last random sample of visitors, how far they how far they hiked during the visit. Based on the responses, the estimated mean was found to be 4.5 miles with an associated margin of error of 0 0.5 miles. Again, that means that he is, that his 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 mean could be minus 0 0.5, so it could be four miles or it could be five miles. So it's like a, his his margin of error is like his like his estimated like how like at what point is he confident that it's, it's in that range? Because obviously you won't always get exact numbers. Which of the following is best conclusion for this graph? It is likely that all visitors hiked between four and five miles. No, that's just the mean. It's likely that most visitors hiked exactly 4.5 miles. No, that's not how it works. It is not possible that any visitor hiked less than three miles. That makes that doesn't make because it's a mean, so it doesn't work that way. And it is plausible that the mean distance hiked for all visitors is between four and five. I like that because it has the margin of error, and it's plausible. It's not an exact statement, which is why D is the right answer there. Okay, number 16. A table above shows the observed mating frequencies among a group of fruit flies raised on either starch medium or maltose medium. What fraction of the observed matings were between fruit flies that were raised on the same medium? So that's that was females that were raised on starch with males that were raised on starch, that's 22, plus females raised on maltose and males raised on maltose, so it's 20. So it's gonna be 42 over, over the 59. Why D is the right answer here. Okay, number 17. The, the figure above shows a graph with six regions that correspond to temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and humidity conditions. In grams of water vapor per cubic meter of air, that will result in different snow crystal shapes when the crystals are grown in the laboratory. Based on the graph, which of the following is a combination of temperature and humidity at which the prism will be formed? So basically, we have this range in prism. So we want to find the data point that's inside this like prism part. So five and 15. Well, that's gonna, that's gonna be like somewhere around here and 15, it, it, it doesn't work. 15 and 0.18, that's gonna be around here. 0 0.18, that's gonna be like around here. No, that's in needles and columns part. Okay, so if it's not gonna be that, 20 and 0 0.02. Yes, that fits right in. So that's why C is the right answer. And if you check D, it would be slightly over, which is why D doesn't work either. Okay, number 18. WAs. I, I, I think it means a, a, a sample, a, or whatever. A sample of 40 fourth graders, of fourth grade students was, sele was selected at random from a certain school. The 40 students completed a survey about the morning announcements, and 32 thought the announcements were helpful, which of the following is the largest population to which the results of the survey can be applied. The 40 students who were surveyed, yes, it can be applied to them because it actually was. So, so far, A is the largest. All fourth grade students at the school, since it was randomly selected, the fourth grade, all fourth grade students, it could be put it to those. However, it, so that means A can be the right answer because while, while it can be point for use for A, a is just too, it's too, we want to know the largest population. The 40 students is, is probably less than the all fourth grade students. All students at the school? No, it's just for fourth graders. All fourth grade students in the, in the county where the school is located? No, because maybe different schools have better announcements or worse announcements. So B is the right answer for 18. Question number 19 and 20, same thing. Brian is comparing five different hay balers, machines that make bales of hay. The bales made are all in the shape of a cylinder, as shown below. The price of each hay baler and the dimensions and 
of the bales of hay that he makes are shown in the table below. So you have a table right here. You want to know of the following, which ratio is closest to the width of bales made by hay baler A to the width of bales made by hay baler D. So A to D, that's 46 to 62. You just, I would just do 46 over 62, and you'd get 0 0.74, which means it's a 0 0.74 to 1 ratio. So it's 19 is A. Remember, this is a calculation, just plug in your calculator. Which of the following, and also, you, since you know 46 is less than is less than 62, you don't even need to put in the calculator because this is the 1 to 1, where it's a less than 1 or to 1 ratio. 20, which of the following is closest to the percent by which the price of hay bale exceeds the price of hay bale is C? So what I would do is, so you take the price of E, which is 46,900, over price of C, which is 32, thousand and then you and then what you would do is you find this and if you put it plug it into a calculator correctly you should get an answer of 1.465 something and that's close to and that so that's a 46.6 i get rounded to 46.6 percent increase so 20 is deep okay number 21 Which ordered pair is the solution to the system of equations above? So I have this. In my opinion, what I would do here is I would just make both of these equal to y. So this, in this case, it would be x minus 1 is equal to y. And it would be x squared minus x minus 3 equals y. So that means x minus 1 equals x squared minus x minus 3. And then I would just put all the, all the everything on one side. So I get x squared minus 2x my plus nine, no, right. minus two equals zero. So if I use quadratic formula, that's negative B, negative B plus or minus square root of B squared minus four AC over two A. So in this case, it would be negative B, which is two plus or minus square root of B squared, which is four minus four times neg negative four. T so minus four times, times negative two which is times one, which is going to be times eight, which is not, which is equal to negative eight. However, since it's negative four AC, it's going to be positive plus eight over two A, which is two, because A is one. This is going to be two plus or minus square root of 12, which is just, which is just two root three over two. And if I simplify this, I get one plus or minus square root three as the x value. So one plus, but it's, just a, it's a solution. So it can be either one. And since a is the only one with one plus root three, and none of the other ones have one plus root three as the x value or one minus root three, a is the right answer for 21. <sighs> I'm talking a lot today. Okay, 22. The graph of the exponential function g in the xy plane passes through the point 0 comma 1 and 1 comma, 1 comma 4 and 2 comma 16. Which of the following is not true? So we know it's an exponential graph. So something like this. I'm showing a sketch here. A line can be drawn as nine is at the graph of G. No, that, that's that's true. Wait, uh, wait, a line, yeah, that, that is true. Sorry. All right, let me just draw a bit. Okay. So, so yeah, a line can be, because if I draw something like this, it won't intersect. So, our line can be drawn as the graph of exactly one point. Yes, I can just draw a line by across it. A line can be drawn as the graph of exactly two points. Yes, because since it's like something like this, since it kind of curves, like, since since it kind of curves like this, I can draw like a line that goes like this, like hits it at two points. So that's why B is okay. However, it hits at three points, there's no way to draw a line like that, which is why D is the right answer there for 22. Okay, number 24, sorry, number 23. In the right triangle, the tangent of one of the two acute angles is root three over three, or tangent of the acute angle. So if I have a triangle, okay, I, I just drew that terribly. But if I triangle and let's say this angle, angle X, the tangent is root three over three, that's opposite over adjacent. So that means if I, if I want to find the tangent of Y, it's going to be three over root three, which is why D is the right answer for 23. 24, in the x-ray plane, 
line L is a slope of two, line K is perpendicular to line L. So that means it's gonna be negative one half of slope because it's negative reciprocal. What, which of the ones would be equation, the equation of line K? So if a line, if a number A, if I move the X to the other side, it would be negative five Y is equal to 10 X plus 20. So this would just be y is equal to negative 2x plus 20. That's not negative 1 half, which is what I wanted, which is what I want. So a is not the right answer. B, in this case, it would be 3x minus 14 is equal to 6y. That would be 1 half x is mi minus 14 over 6, which is, not, which is not negative 1 half. So C, it would just be, it would be 4x minus 17 equal to 2y. In this case, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just 2x, which is not what I want. I want negative one half x. In this case, it's gonna be 12y is equal to negative six x plus 36. Divide both of them by 12, y is equal to negative one half x plus three, and that works, which is why d is the right answer because it has the slope of negative one half x. Okay, number 25. The diagram above represents Edward T. Hall's co concept of space surrounding a person defined by four non-overlapping regions. Intimate space is the region inside a circle of radius one foot. Personal space is the region within a circle of radius one four feet, but outside in, in intimate space. Social space is this region within a circle of, 12, of, of radius 12 feet, but outside personal space. Public space is the region within a circle of radius 12, 25 feet, but outside social space. Which, what, is, what is the area in square feet of the shaded region representing the person's social space? So you wanna know what the square, so in this case, I would, I would take the, this, the, this, this, the area of this whole circle and then subtract it minus the area of the, of, the, of the personal space circle because that would give me the shaded thing. So in this case, social space is 12, radius of 12. So pi, it's pi r squared is the area, is the formula for area. So it's gonna be 144 pi. And the area of the personal space, since it's not the greater one, that's going to be of four, four feet. So since it's four feet, it's four times four squared, which is 16, 16 pi. And I subtract these two, and I get 128 pi, which is why B is the right answer there for 25. Wait, sorry about that. Okay, back. 26, Anita created a batch of green paint by mixing two ounces of blue paint with three ounces of yellow paint. Already I'm seeing a ratio start to form where she, mix, she mixes 1.5 times more yellow paint than blue paint. So I, I'm keeping that back in my mind. She, she must mix the second batch in the same ratio. So again, we have that ratio come up of blue paint, of blue and yellow paint as the first batch. If she uses five ounces of blue paint for the second batch, how much yellow paint should you use? Because I know it's a 1.5 ratio, that's, that's what I'm looking at. So A, exactly five ounces. No, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. B, three ounces more than the amount. We don't, we, we don't really know that, so that's how it works. C, 1.5 times the amount of yellow paint used in the first batch. It, 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 but the problem is two to five is now, two times 1.5 is not equal five. So we're not scaling up by a factor 1.5. However, 1.5 times the amount of blue paint used in the second batch, that works. Okay, it's the same rate, it's the same 1.5 ratio. So D is the right answer for 26. 27, in the equation above, A is a constant. For what value of A does the equation of infinitely many solutions? For, if I want to have infinitely many solutions, that means I basically want to end up with negative 12 equals negative 12. So for that to happen, I thought I would factor this out. And I'll factor distribute it out. Minus 12 minus 8x. So already I have the minus 12, so I didn't make this into 8x, so that the 8x cancels out, and I have negative 12 equals negative 12, which gives me infinite solutions. So for me to get negative 8x, in order for me to, get, so for me to cancel out the negative 8x, this has to be 8x, so A has to equal 8. 27 is D. 28, the wholesale price of a kilogram of lentils decreased by 1% for the previous month. So it, it's an exponential, I can already tell, for six consecutive months. If X is the number of months since the price began to drop and Y is the cost of a kilogram of lentils, which of the following equations could model the cost of lentils over this t time period? So we are, already know this is gonna have to be 1.01. It's gonna be exponential, so I only know A and B are wrong. And since I know it, 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 so it decreases by 1%, I'm gonna be 0 0.99. So 
So that means C is the right answer there. The equation above is true for all x greater than two, for where r and t are positive constants. But what is the what is the value of r times t? So in this case, I'm I, I can tell that what I have to do is I have to make the I have to make I just I have to add a fraction because I'll make numbers the same. So this would be two x plus ten plus three x minus six over x minus two times x plus five is equal to is equal to this thing. It's equal to this one. So because I'm doing that, I know that the, I'm since the denominator is the same, I know the, the these have to, the numerators have to be the same. So two, uh, if I say this would be five x plus four is equal to r x plus t. So that means r r equals five, t equals four, and if I want to know what r t is. I multiply these two to get twenty. C is the right answer. Thirty. If a x plus a equals three, where a is a non-zero constant. Which of the following must be equal to x plus one? Well, here if I just divide both sides by a, I get x plus one is equal to three over a. So x plus one equal to three over a. D. D. Okay, number thirty-one. What value of x satisfies the equations above? Here I'm gonna I'm gonna square both sides to get x plus four equals one twenty-one. X equal to one hundred seventeen. The box plots below above category. Summarize the distribution of the number of fish caught each day on two commercial fishing boats for a season. By how many fish does the median number of fish caught each day on boat B exceed the median number on boat A? If you don't know the median, it's just this line right here in the in the box. That's the median. So how much does it exceed by? 30 to 35, that's five. 33, if A is the mean and B is the median of nine consecutive integers, what is the value of A minus B? Well, just think about it logically. If it's one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah blah blah. The mean, the mean, the mean will just be the middle number because, because if since it's consecutive, it'll all average out to the middle number. So even if you just think of it, like one, two, three, the mean will always, as long as if it's an odd number, if it's odd number of numbers, consecutive integers, the mean will be the middle number because if it, uh, it all equal out to the middle number, and the median is already the middle number, which is something we already know, which is why the mean and the median are the same. So the value of a minus b, which is the mean minus the median, is just going to be zero. Thirty-four. The equation above gives the height of an object ab above the ground y in feet t seconds after it is launched on a platform. Platform. How many seconds after it is launched? It is launched. Does the object reach the ground? That means we want to know when y is equal to zero. So zero equals negative sixteen t squared plus sixty-four t plus eighty. I really I can divide both sides by six by six negative sixteen to get zero equals t squared minus four minus eight. Minus four t, my bad, t. So in this case, I factor this out. So equals zero equals t. <clears throat> Sorry, this is minus five. My my mistake. Minus five. T minus four. Sorry, t minus five. My mistake. T minus five times t plus one. So I know t can't equal one, negative one, because uh, you have negative one seconds. It means t must equal five seconds. So how many seconds? Five. 35, i equals v over r. The formula above is for Ohm's law, is for electric circuit with current i in amphimeter, amphimeter, amperes, whatever, I don't know, I can't, I can't speak right now. Amperes, amperes, I don't know. Potential difference V and volt and resistance R in ohms. So there's resistance of 500 ohms. So already have over 500. And the potential will be generated by an N6 volt, volt battery that produces a total difference of 6N volts, 6N. Eek, which, and 6N. And it, the circuit has to have current of no more than 25. So it has to be less than or equal to. 0.25. So what is the greatest number n of six volt batteries that can be used? In this case, what I would do is I would I would solve for what n can be and I would put it down, I, I would I would round it down to the nearest whole number. Because we can't have uh, we can't have a, 
uh, what's called uh, half a battery or something like that. So multiply both of them by 500, you get 6n is equal to 125. And you solve for n, you get 125 over 6, and you plug that into your calculator. You get 20.83 plus 8.83 TTT, blah, blah, blah. But since we, since we had to round it down to the newest number because we want to know what the maximum number of batteries is, it's 20 batteries. 26 in an XY plane, line L intersects the Y, y axis at the point 0, 96 and passes to the point 2, comma 2. If the point 20, comma W lies on the line K, what is the value of W? Well, we can tell from here, we, we, I would solve for slope right here. So it's Y2 minus Y1, so it'd be 2 plus 6 over 2 minus 0. That's 8, 8 over 2, which is equal to 4, and which makes sense because it goes up by 8 and go, right thing. So yeah, so we know the slope is 8. So now what I would do is, and now I can, I can write the equation Y equals 4X minus 6 because that, that's what the Y intercept is. Now let's plug in 20 here. Y equals 4 times 20 minus 6. That's 80, 80 minus 6, which is equal to 74. Okay, 37. In my opinion, 37 is the hardest question on the test. In a science classroom, when labs are performed, students are seated at lab tables. If the teacher assigns two, stu two students to each lab table and four, four additional lab tables will be as needed to seat all the students. If the teacher assigns four students to each lab table, four tables will not be used. How many students are in the classroom? So if I was to visualize this for you, let's say I, let's say I have like, let's say I have like a bunch of other tables, okay? If, if she puts two people at each table, she would need four extra tables in order to fit everyone. However, if she put four people per table, blah, blah, blah she would need, she would have four extra tables. So now I want, what I want to know is how many students, right? So that means when I'm writing my two equations, that would have to be one of the, like one of the variables. So in this case, what I'm, I'm going to make the number of students equal to y. And I'm I'm also gonna let twelve I'm gonna let x equal the number of tables. So in this case, or in equation I can write for the first one to choose so that means y over two, so, and that's equal to x plus four because it's how many tables are in the class plus you need an additional four. So if you divide each student by two into twos. She would need four extra dish tables. However, if she divides both each student by four, she would need x minus four. She would have four left over here, which means she would need less four tables, less than the number of tables if she if she divided the total students by four into groups of four. So now that I have these two things, I can just solve. I would if I would multiply both by two first to get um to by four to get two y or like actually I'll first do first one to by multiply both by two to get y equals two x plus eight. And this one by four, y equals four x minus 16. And then break these equal to each other. Four x minus 16 equals two x plus eight. And if you solve this properly, you get <coughs> you get two x equals 24, x equals 12. Now I know x equals 12, I just plug this back in. x 12 plus four, which is 16. 16 equals y over two y equals 32, which means there's 32 total students. See that for these types of questions, you need to find ways to write, to write this, like you need to find, find two, so since I have two different stuff, I, like like the two, like two students or four students, I can tell I, I'm gonna need to write two equations to find a system of equations. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to like try to find, like plug in variables to find two equations I can write. I, that's why I think number 37 is the hardest question on this test. Okay, number 38, number, the number y is 20% greater than the number x, it means y is equal to 1.2x, and the number z is 20% less than y, which means z is equal to 0.8y. Or, or if I were to write this into fractions, actually no, I'll, I'll do 0.8y. 
So now I, I, I want to put everything in terms of y. So I wanna, so I'll divide, I'll do z over 0 0.8, which gives me 1.25z. Because 0 0.8 0, 0 .8 is just 4 over 5, so it'd be 5 over 4z equals y. And 1.2x equals y. So that means 1.2x equals 1.25z. And if I want to know how many how many times z is x, then that means I would divide this by 1.25 to find z is 0 0.96 times x. So the answer is 0 0.96.